and then welcome everybody again to day two of the introduction to R and R Studio. And uh, what we can see on my screen at the moment is pretty much where we finished off before, which was um, we finished off with what does this function do? So the work on the right is the cloud information, that, well, the scripts that I was writing and on the left are the slides. And today we're going to cover going to start with my I think I said yesterday probably did my favorite part of coding generally is data wrangling and cleaning so I just make this a bit bigger because it's oh good and another image drawn by Alison Horst to try and put into some sort of visual context what this means when we say data wrangling it seems a bit of a new word that's kind of there are fair number of new words that I've encountered in terms of R, but also data science and how people refer to the jobs that we do. And data wrangling is a bit like the cleaning, tidying of data. And it feels a bit like this, where it's just like you're really struggling sometimes to get the data into a usable sheet, uh, sheet? shape is the work, word. I'm not doing very well with words today. And so uh, it's referred to quite a lot in terms of tidying up the data. You might be able to see on the image, it says dplyr to the left and data to the little monsters that are being captured. A bit more of a, a sort of an explanation, reshaping, transforming. There's a lot of these words and vocabulary to try and put into context, a kind of like a, um, a real world context of what we're doing with our data, because it can be quite abstract in its um, descriptions. Trying to get it into a form that's easier to work with, and part of that was what I introduced yesterday in terms of tidy data, and which we'll cover again today as we go through this. Oh, actually, we'll cover it on the next slide. Look at that. That was a nice segue, as they say. Um, so tidy data is kind of crucial for many, many different things that you're going to do to your data. So I referred, this is my kind of own observation on this, in that human-friendly data is what we tend to get in Excel, where you get one row per thing that you're looking at maybe it's per patient per hospital and you're reading it from left to right as if you're reading a book and that's really friendly to human reading but that isn't what we can there's not really that much we could do with it when we're doing statistics or visualizations or using other packages particularly in R maybe also in other languages and certainly in things like SQL where we go for more machine friendly so it reads downward and it's a bit harder for humans to see. We use these words variable and observation and they translate to column and row in terms of what they represent and broadly means long and wide and in fact that's kind of like a, a view that's been picked up by the dplyr i think it's dplyr it might be tidyverse generally i think it's from a different package but it's part of that kind of tidyverse universe um there are two functions now called pivot wider and pivot longer and so they kind of take that movement of your data and how it's formed into some functions and use those terms but today we're going to start off with the just five there are many many more functions within dplyr and can be other functions used with it as well and we're going to focus on we're at, at there are a few more snuck in there but we're going to focus on these ones as kind of like chapters within this section it Kind of written out here how to say it dplyr don't worry if you said something else or heard something else i think it's kind of tricky with some of these r uh, packages because there are ways of saying them that's kind of accepted same throughout most of computer software and if we're just learning like self-taught it's very easy to just read it as you would read it and then find out that other people are saying other things so it's just a little bit of an indication of how it's said i think the ply r is the it their, their symbol is pliers because you're manually sort of like moving stuff. Most of the puzzles and the problems that we're trying to solve in our code, with our code, can be solved by these few five functions. And as I say, they fit with other ones. And uh, these functions are very powerful on their own. And you can use them in combination. And you can repeat their use as well. So there's a lot of um, possibilities within them. And we're going to use a data set, mental health inpatient capacity data set for this exploration. Um, this is kind of close to my heart because this data represents and I can see my trust in this data, uh, but it's older data. And part of this will be looking at the changes in the number and occupancy of mental health beds. And just to give that context as well, because I've been working with this data more recently, is that the numbers of beds have changed substantially over the years and we've got fewer and fewer and fewer. So when people in mental health services require a bed and there aren't enough locally, people need to go to out of area. So it's incredibly important 
in terms of cost and also for the patient support because as they move out of area they often could lose their support networks too or it makes it harder if you're in another part of the country and that does happen and continues to happen. This is from a national return with NHS England. Um, it is available, it's partially clean, so somebody has cleaned it for us. And when we get things from national returns and uh, government statistics even, there is a move in government statistics to move to more accessible spreadsheets, which are accessible for screen readers for humans, for people, but also that helps us in coding. But it does mean that there are gaps and spaces and, and strange bits of things all over. And we will do a bit of cleaning today, which is part of an introduction to how real world data can be. And our world, our data is very real world, as they say. So we're going to refresh some of the points. Oh, go back into my cloud. We're going to refresh some of the points that we did before in terms of loading the data. I'm just my my whole layout and my edge thing has just changed so I'm not really too sure what's going on there with all the stuff on the side got a bit confused by that right I'm going to go to a new script just to keep it separate and it's also to reinforce and refresh your memories of how to do a new script so there are a couple of ways as I mentioned before so we can either go to the file new file and then the drop down menu which has the shortcut keyboard shortcut and I can't use my mouse Clicking on the symbol just underneath the file to select a short from a short menu, the R script, or Control Alt Shift and N because I'm on a browser, it's got Shift added. And if you're on your own computer, it's just as it is on the slide, which is Control Shift and N for a new one. So I'm going to do that with my short, um, my keyboard shortcuts, and then you get a new R script. As you can see, there's a little R, tiny tiny R symbol on my screen with untitled one for a new script. And we're going to load the beds data as well. Right. And so we will go back to import, which is underneath the environment tab on the top right, almost left, right uh, panel of the screen and go to from text read R dot dot dot. So we get this. Oh, I'm just seeing if I could do it. Yeah, OK browse and then you can select beds underscore data dot csv can uh, cancel i mean open um i'm going to cancel it and the reason why i'm pausing on all of this is because actually i think this is a good point to say that if you find the file in the bottom right um tab quadrant so the, the bottom right quadrant finder tab files and then click on beds underscore data dot csv where the wizard at the top helps you locate your files by browsing to them. If you click on it, click on the file that you are interested in, you get two options. One of them is to view the file, which actually opens it up in the kind of CSV view, which is all squished together really with the delimiters being um, commas. If we remove that and then use the second option, which I find a bit easier because I don't have to use my mouse so much, import data set dot dot dot, it brings up the same wizard but with the data in it, because I don't need to tell the system, the computer, the package, which file it is I'm looking at. And so that one's a bit easier to do. So now it looks like the screen on the left, but a bit of a shorter route to it. Don't only a couple of clicks rather than several things to go through. Personal preference on what you would require. So this view in the wizard is quite good because you can see that um, it's not quite right at the top. So the, the column headers, are taking the top, the uppermost column uh, row, and um, we've got some metadata underneath, which is quite common in some of these uh, national returns, certainly currently from the NHS and also from uh, the government. And so we can skip those. And I think that is something you can do when you import data into things like Excel and SQL, I think, when you're bringing in some spreadsheets too. And the area is in the import options. You can change the name of the object as it becomes. I'm going to leave that, which is default. I'm going to skip three. And if you click out of that section, it then refreshes. Um, I think if you just stay in it and leave it for a few seconds and hesitate, as I have done once before and I was talking away, it then refreshed and did the change. But often I have to click out or tab. You can now see that the uppermost column names 
have moved up. So they now look as you would as you'd expect. So it says date, org code, org name, whereas pre previously it was filling in where it was a gap and it said X3, X4, X5. The code at the bottom has also changed as well. So there's an extra parameter in now where it says the name of the file that it's going to be importing, comma, skip equals three. So that has now moved those up. We have to be very careful of dates. So we're kind of pausing at the moment for this section um, because any movement of data between systems, any programming language will always have dates as a, re a sticking point, really. Uh, as I said before, I've worked with SQL. Excel has its own date um, foibles, let's say, with serial dates. And here, if this is quite common. If a program can't recognize the format of the date, it goes to character. If it can't recognize the format of anything, it always defaults to characters or texts. So dates here are in character form because our this is UK date format, date date format, but the package and the programs are related to US dates. So I don't think it could match it. And it went, oh, that's not a real date. So this is a character. We can change the date format in the wizard. And if you click on character or date or anywhere in that box, you get a short menu, it's a shortish menu. And we can select date in there. Now I will pause here just to make sure that everybody is on this because it's kind of crucial. I've, I've seen people sort of like miss this bit can go really rapidly. Um, the format is what we tell the program that the date is currently in. So it thinks it's US format, month, date, year. Um, we need to swap that round to day, month, year. So it's a bit of a quick like magic thing. It feels like, like uh, was it sleight of hand trick? We're moving it from US to UK by telling through the wizard that this is a different format. When you click OK, Lots of code appears at the bottom and the date format changes in the wizard. So it's now year, month, day that we can view, but it's a date format. Now, for some people who may not have you say, I'm not sure, SQL does this quite a lot or SQL database administrators do it, where they use a universal date format, which is unambiguous, which is year, month, day. In reports to the general public or to people within your organizations, that's a, an odd date format. Um, so when you're looking at your screen, and particularly for those who use Excel, maybe say exclusively, this looks very strange. And somebody did ask in a previous course, how do we change it on my screen? Because I want it to look like day, month, year. I went back to NHSR Slack and asked there, can we do this? And I got the, the response back, yes, you can, but you must change your computer system. And it's kind of advised not to do that because, well, you can do it, but it's just a bit, bit of a, a step too far for many people to do. But what I will say is if you are producing reports, which we will cover later in our markdown for other people, you can, um, I'm going to say control, manipulate, you can change the date format so it can be recognizable to people. So although you see as an analyst or a data scientist or a person using data, as in this back to front, it feels like date format, when you then produce it in table form or to other people in our markdown reports or um, presentations, you can manipulate the data to a better format for you. Anyway. What we can see here at the bottom is all of this date information coding. So we've had a couple of clicks and it's now come back with a lot of um, code, which is brilliant. We can copy that. I'm just going to yep, highlight that code like I did before, just that line, cancel that, and then paste it into my um, script. I'm going to write library tidyverse at the top. I think if anybody's on, oops. If anybody is on the cloud, it probably still is loaded, which is what I've got here. But if you're on your own computer and you reset that session thing, it might have lost your loaded files, your loaded packages, sorry, not your loaded files, and actually maybe your loaded object before. Um, is that right? Yeah. Is it beds? Was I doing beds? Oh, I haven't done beds. That's right. So I didn't take my code. Yes, I'm getting confused because I still had this because my cloud hasn't been refreshed, really. It's a, it's a very strange thing with the cloud. You have to force a refresh. Probably a good time to say if you wanted to force a refresh on whichever system you're using, the session menu and then restart our control shift and F10 should restart. But I think I might have a kind of the cloud thing so it didn't remove my um, object. 
As I referred before, when we were talking about the workspace and setting it up, going in and out, when you've closed your session and having these things being removed, it's a good time sometimes to clear your system. And I've done this so many times when it produced so many bits of documents and not documents, but objects and written a lot of script and loaded packages and then removed them and it gets a bit messy. And you just want to check that everything runs as you expect it. You don't have to close the entire um, session down as in the entire program. You can just restart your session. And it's good practice just to make sure that everything runs as you expect. So that's a nice uh, feature in there. So if I run this data, which is like, oh, I haven't run the library because I reset everything. Very clever. There we go. I have now got my tidyverse loaded for the first time in my session, having restarted it. And uh, it's got all that information at the bottom. If I now do control and enter for the beds data, I get the beds data as an object in the top right hand corner with environment. If I then write beds underscore data on line underneath line six and then do control and enter, I get the information coming down in the console which is the same as in the slide on the left. And with this data, uh, we're going to look at five particular, we're going to explore really five particular verbs, as they call it. They kind of move between the words verbs and functions, specifically for dplyr, because I think they, they're trying to bring some of this abstract coding uh, work into the real world. So it's a bit like you are you're, they're doing things, they're functions, so they call them verbs as well. We're going to use a range, some of these make sense already, just looking at them, arrange and filter, that kind of makes sense, mutate, probably makes less sense, I mean it has context, but not necessarily so obvious. Group by, that might be familiar to people from SQL, it's slightly different, and I will highlight why it's slightly different, um, and summarize, which again can kind of work out, but maybe not sure We'll go through that one. Again, just to refresh your memory on the fact that this is US and UK uh, text format, this is not usual for all packages. It's just a really nice inclusive way that the tidyverse people have maintained. So summarize can be used with a Z or an S, which is nice. I like it. So to take this kind of concept of um, things being like in the real world, I'm going to use an analogy now, uh, well, somebody else's analogy really of what we're doing with these functions or verbs in the context of recipes. Um, and you do hear things like code recipes as well. So there's that continuation of extension of this coming into the real world. And I'm gonna go through briefly, it feels a bit strange really, mashed potato, taking a, ma a potato and making a mashed potato. And I, this, this makes me laugh a little bit because um, order matters often in your code and as it does with recipes. And I have done this when I was a bit younger, just a tiny bit younger. I got the order wrong with mashed potato and I tried to mash it when I hadn't cooked it. So it does matter and it's worth reinforcing that, particularly when it comes to your code as well. So we take our potato, we then peel it, we slice it, and we tend to slice it in a particular size order. So in this case, it'd be like medium and boil it for a certain length of time and then mash it. My past self was not so familiar with this, but my current self is, and you might be familiar to you too. But then if we uh, go through each step, we're looking at the potato, we're starting with an R object, a table or a data frame table if you're kind of more familiar with that language from SQL and Excel but it's always referred to as data frame in R. Peel which is an action, a verb, function in this case and it's become a function because we've put these uh, brackets around it as well. Slice has brackets and whereas peel had nothing in it, it was just a, an action on its own, a function that works without anything in it Slice needs something added in it too. Now, like we did before with ggplot2, some of the um, things just defaulted. And on this occasion, we're going to be specific and say the size equals medium. And put medium in substring as well, because it's text. And then boil, again, that can be any amount of time. I suppose there might be a default time, but on this occasion, we're gonna say and stipulate time equals 25 and 25 would be a number. So it's no longer in quotation marks. And the output would be the mashed potato. But we've also now done this weird uh, symbol, like magically replaced 
like a placeholder moved then as a kind of like continuation of your process and put in this symbol it's a strange symbol I don't know it's not strange I do know where it came from I was about to say I didn't know where it came from that's the other one that I'm going to also introduce later um, this one is actually called a pipe and it comes from another package called Magritte. It's been so widely used in terms of dplyr and I think it's it makes a lot of sense because it moves your um, computer program in a sense from one line to the next line to the next line and it's essentially then do do this then this then this and it's so useful in terms of coding that it's been recently updated in BASR if people have ever experienced BASR or would like to use it a bit more and you now have a pipe that is available through BASR so you don't need to load any packages to get that information. It's um, slightly different to the one we're going to use for dplyr but you'll see that symbol a lot if you see some code from other people using dplyr specifically. The point is it reflects the, that um, then so it's a nice little then symbol. A few characters which is a few typing bits but there is a shortcut of course there's a shortcut there's always a shortcut in computer programming and we combine <clears throat> simple steps to solve very complex puzzles our code can get very very long uh, because we're solving these long problems so we're going to use it now my screen's gone dark so my reflection's gone dark too we're going to use it in the context of questions on the data set that we've got so we'll have long questions like this which are quite common I suppose in, in many of our analytical worlds work which organization provided the highest number of mental health beds and we can order our data so if I just move that across and we can write beds underscore data and it finds it so um, autofill I've got the word yesterday it eluded me completely autofill tab it and it fills in the word and then Control, Alt and M will give you that funny symbol if you're going to do that shortcut, Control, Shift and M for Mike. And that fills in the spaces around it as well to give it nice um, human readable, fr human friendly readable readability. I'll get there eventually. And if I put the next line in and put a range, beds underscore AV, it also gives you these two options saying beds and I'm going to choose AV and do the tab. Just to pause for a bit, just to explain with this um, symbol as well. So what I was doing is I had my cursor right up against the A and then I did Control, Shift and M. So it put the spaces on either side. What's nice about this is if you put the space in already, you know, you quick type her and you do the space and then do Control, Shift and M, it matches it too. So it kind of keeps that format wherever you are. I'm going to do two spaces to see what happens. Mm, it doesn't recognize, it's not that clever. But if you do the space automatically, it matches one, which makes sense, really. Again, it's all about readability. It will work without those spaces. It will also work all on the one on the same line and you can go on and on and on and on. But that does not make it so friendly for people to read. So convention is to use each line for each function. But that's convention. And it does vary slightly for some different formats of where you're working short code type thing within, say, our markdown might be slightly different. But this is kind of convention and it's always about making it easier for you to read it, scan it. If I do control and enter now, I then get in my console the ordered, ordered information. And it looks like this on the left in a different kind of format well not format different color actually it's come through in a different color and royal free london has average beds two and then it goes upwards so you can see that the default although we've arranged it is um ascending to yes it's ascending order and we want descending order because we want the most not the least so what we can do is put in a desk short for descending around it's a it's a function itself so it has these brackets and I'm going to do it in a way that double click the beds underscore AV. If I put an open bracket to, if I just do the open bracket, it closes it as well. It doesn't over type. I mean, I must get, must be clear that I use this so much now that when I go into other tools like Microsoft Word or um, SSMS and I try to do this, it just obliterates my text because it just over types. But in R Studio, it doesn't. It puts the open and the close bracket wherever you've highlighted it, which is just I find that really nice. It means I don't have to navigate so much. Go between the two uh, brackets and then write desk. So however you do it, whether you type it out in full or if you use that kind of like little shortcut, 
it's up to you. It's fine. Whatever is suits. Control and enter. And I get my data at the bottom. And now it's switched around. And that is my trust, actually, which is Nottingham Health. Nottinghamshire Healthcare Trust had the most beds, but that was in 2013, 2014, and things have changed a lot. Is that okay for everybody? We're going to go on to the next question. Which two organisations provided the highest number of mental health beds in September 2018? So breaking such a long question down, we'll use a range which we used before to find the highest, the most. That's using that range and a desk for descending but we only need the observations in a particular quarter this data is actually in quarters and we want September 2018 whereas before you could see that Nottinghamshire Healthcare was the highest but that was reflected in 2013 and 2014 and we're going to use filter which is kind of self-explanatory that would be the where clause in SQL and you've got the sort funnel I think it is in Excel it's probably called filter as well in some other programs so I'm going to write it all out, beds underscore data, control shift and, ooh, ooh, keep going backwards, data. Um, control shift and M for the pipe, which then is all nicely, neatly set out. And then filter date, and this is when you need your date to be a date, um, equals 2018-09-01. Not very good with writing that, control and enter. And so we only get, at least in the top 10 here, um, the quarter of September. The section underneath, which uh, I, I kind of opened up a little bit too soon, really, it was supposed to be like a big reveal now, but I did it a bit earlier, is this two equals sign, which isn't so necessary in many other, well, I say many other in, say, SQL, or I don't even think it's necessary in Excel. Equals means equals, but in this context, it's double equals because it's a test of equality. It goes through the data and says, does this equal, is it true or false? Does it equal test of equality? Now, if you, and I do this myself, I, I often forget. If you put the single equals in there, they've coded because errors are not always very clear in our programs because they're, they're default and they can be quite um, techy kind of re reference back, but they've worked quite hard in dplyr and ggplot2 to some extent too in writing out the common issues that people have and, and being a bit more verbose, let's say, in their errors and warnings. And this gives you the hint that maybe your date should be equals equals. Now, the other thing that I realized is that I do a lot of negative, and you shouldn't do this in SQL so much because it slows down your processing, but I often do or think in terms of negative points. So if you didn't want your September quarter, you wanted to remove it in, um, symbol terms it's an exclamation mark and the equals instead of equals equals and if i do control and enter and run that we get the the top 10 are all from 2013 so it's just the data that we had but if we showed it all it would um remove have removed september 2018. i'm going to go back to equals oops And then we're going to add into this. I'm going to add, I'm going to share that code so that you've got that too. So I'll share the eventual code that we've worked with, so you can copy that too. <clears throat> and I'm going to add in a range. Now, actually, interestingly, in terms of uh, working, in a sense, it doesn't really matter whether you put your range before your filter or after your filter. Analytically, you'll get the same if you think about it. You either arrange it and then filter it, or filter it and then arrange it. So it's it's up to you, but I think what would be better is actually not doing what's on the slide and doing control shift and M at the end of this filter and putting it afterwards. Because if you kind of think of it analytically, I'm taking a big data set, it's not huge, this one, but say if it were two million rows and if you wanted to just get it to one, qu one, yeah, one quarter, it's actually computationally heavy ordering it and then saying, I want this section. It's a bit easier to go filter down or where clause or, or filter as you're doing in Excel, and then just concentrate on that smaller piece. So I'm going to put that in there. So a range e uh, desk for descending. I'm doing the open brackets and it closes it for me automatically, which I like to. And then dev, uh, beds underscore AV, not dev, nothing to do with dev at all. And now I get East London and Nottinghamshire Healthcare in that quarter as being the highest beds average. 
Okay. You can shout up at any point, really in, interrupt me. That's fine. So which five organizations had the highest percentage bed occupancy in September 2018? Quite a long question. Nice to break it down and let's do that. We're building on these, these things too. So we're referring back to what we've already covered. We're going to look at the highest, which is to use a range as we did before. We know how to then filter down to the quarter that we're interested in this September 2018. Yep, I was just getting mixed up with my dates. But percentage bed occupancy, if you look at the information we've got, we've got beds average and occupancy average, but nothing to do with percentage in the data. But we can create that. And that's when this strangely sort of named function or verb comes into it called mutate. Now mutate, um, I've been teaching it for a long time and for a long time I just sort of like accepted it and then it suddenly the penny dropped and I was like oh now I know what's happening. So mutate is changing your whole data set. It's adding it in Excel terms you're taking a, a data table and you're adding a column in and then putting something into it for each row and the same in SQL you'll take your table you add a column and then you add some data in there. Um, so it's about changing the structure of your data frame or table or um, I can't, I think it's a table in Excel as well, isn't it? So you're not doing anything else to the table structure. Well, you are, you know, you're adding to it is the point. I'll get there in a bit. Write it all out. Beds underscore data, control shift and M. Next line, mutate. And you can call this anything you like. So it's, it's a, a new column name, header. So I'm going to just to make the point, call it percentage, it, although it tried to do autofill, it doesn't exist yet. So I'm just ignore, ignoring that. And I'm going to put occupancy just to be explicit and make it really, really, really long. It's far too long, but it's just to show it's different and it will still work. Occupancy average is the column divided by beds underscore average. And then control and enter. Now, mine's all squashed on my screen, so I'm going to go back and run it again. And now I can see there's a new column added into my data. I sort of mentioned it yesterday when we looked at some day, uh, the ggplot2 data that we used, the capacity underscore AE. Um, although I've changed the data thing here, it has no effect to the object because we haven't saved it to the object and it has absolutely no effect at all on the underlying data that we've imported. Everything we're doing sort of exists in this script whilst I have it, it's got a temporary table kind of um, concept in terms of SQL, but in Excel, it would be, you haven't saved your file, I guess. It sort of exists in this area, but it hasn't changed any of your underlying data at all. I guess it's like a pivot in Excel where you've taken the data, you change your pivot, but you haven't changed anything underlying. We've got these uh, percentage occupancies now on the side, on the, the, the actual column. And a bit like in SQL, Excel is not quite the same because it, it's not automatic in a sense. You, you, it always goes, to, any new columns go to the end of your um, column system. So it always goes to the, the last point. Whereas in Excel, you can choose where you put it. This is not a test of equality. This is more in an alias or an as in terms of create this data and call it that. If I do two equals just to break it, it's always fun to break things. You get this uh, error that is a little bit um, more verbose, sort of you have to read it a bit more carefully, but it's saying that the object, meaning the column percentage occupancy, it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist because we're trying to create it. So it's not sure what it is I'm trying to do. Percentage occupancy doesn't equal this sum, this mathematical formulation, because it doesn't exist. And then I'll make it exist by doing a single equals, which is nice. I'm going to combine them all together and I'm going to write it all out so it just just all together so beds underscore data is your data object control shift and m for the pipe next line mutate perk I'm going to call it per cock on this so I match the screen on the left but as I say you can call it anything you like I just give you a bit of a warning that if you use things and we'll talk about naming things if you used x or y or other kind of like very very short like very quick but 
if you're then going to go back over it and do readability type terms, it might be like, what does X refer to? And I have had it where somebody gave me a chart which was like X equals X. And it was a bit like, that's the X axis equals the X. Which one's it? So try and go for some real words. It can be really hard, but just keep practicing. And even when you practice, I still find it hard. Control shift and M for the next pipe. Filter, I'm gonna filter first here. It's quite good, isn't it? Equals, equals, and then struggle with writing the date, <laughs> typing the date. And then at the end of that, outside of that, close bracket, control shift and M again, next line, arrange and we're going to arrange it finally actually before I do that another good thing I should have been doing is checking each time I've written it to make sure it runs I was just like running through and I shouldn't have really done that if I do control and enter just to make sure this runs now yeah there we go so we've got the mutation at the end as we'd expected and it's filtered to this the, and the no errors is the point break down your coding I was just racing ahead I told you I enjoy this I got too excited control shift and m at the end of filter and arrange descending bracket perk oc, which is the new column I've created. And then I'm going to do control and enter. And that works. Now I went a bit quickly, so and then stopped and went back over it again. So any questions about that, please throw them into the chat. And what we're seeing here. Um, is that percentage occupancy, the two that crop up at the top are Royal Free London and Oxleys. They're both at 100% occupancy for September 2018. I also want to point out, and I think you can see this anyway, it's really good when you look at um, percentages. If you can, you can't always, depending on how the data is coming to you, finding out what is underneath that data. So two average an average bed's occupancy of two is much easier to get to 100% than it is to having 384. So these are very, they're distinctly different um, sites. Oh, that's the window cleaner. Sorry, that was a bit confusing for me. They're distinctly different sites. So they're 100% is a different kind of 100%. If you have a smaller number of things, it's more likely to occur. Got a question in the chat. Can you create a memory variable for dates? instead of hard coding the dates? Um, I'm not too sure in quite what that, that kind of context means, but I would, I think in terms of programmatically setting things in R, it is possible to do um, in terms of, a yes, yeah, so got a response, which is great that you can assign the dates. So um, I don't, if you use a different language uh, or program, could you just, point out which one you use and then I can try and put it into context because you can SQL Server yeah okay so you're using maybe parameters in SQL Server SQL scripts and you might put that at the top of your script and then it gets referenced throughout it within that script that concept exists in R as um, it was mentioned earlier in the chat you can assign your dates you can do that at the top so you could say date equals today and then you're referring to today in your later code I was a bit worried that uh, how to explain, I should say, rather than worried, because you can do it, I think, like globally, you could use some other concept, but certainly SQL server, SQL script type of thing. Um, again, you can do that in Excel, you could sort of assign it saying, um, calling it today's date and then putting in your formula in the next feature and then refer back to that cell as a named cell. So you certainly can do that in the programmatic languages of Python and are specifically that we're covering today. They're, the, they're really fun as well. We start using real words and you can just change it in one section. I like that. Next question then, brilliant question that was. Um, the question to pose for our data is, what was the mean number of beds across all trusts for each value of date? I'm gonna break this down. Now, uh, we're going to look at summary statistics when we look at mean. So mean is the average, or it could be median, uh, which is probably more appropriate actually for mental health beds because we have some extreme values in our number of beds and uh, length of stays is actually the most extreme. But we're going to use a particular function which looks very, very similar to mutate um, called summarize. <clears throat> now, it's kind of as I said before, it, it sort of makes sense what we're doing. We're summarizing. But to, un to kind of see what happens underneath the summary, 
it's a bit different to mutate. If I just type it out, first of all, beds underscore data, and then it'll show you what happens underneath. Control, Shift, and M. Actually, first of all, I'm going to highlight beds data. It could help if I spelt it correctly, beds underscore data. Control and Enter just to run it. I haven't run it with the um, pipe at the end because it will expect and then it will go, well, you haven't finished. Actually, I will show you what that looks like. Control and Enter. You get a little plus at the end of your script saying, and and what? what what's next? If you want to come out of that at any point, I've done that so many times where I've missed a bracket and it's expecting something else to finish off. You can either close off what it is that you're doing, like finish off with the bracket, or you can just press escape when you're on that flashing cursor in the console. I'm going to do escape to go back to this arrow to the right. So beds underscore data is my object, pipe, and then I'm going to write summarize, which is the UK version spelling format, mean, beds, I've got a spelling mistake in the slide, which I'm going to leave because it's quite good and it looks like it's different. Mean is a function. We can see here it's selected here. It's called base. So we're, I've actually snuck in or we snuck in a few other functions to work with dplyr. Base functions work with dplyr, which is good. And you don't need to load anything with base. R. It just exists in your session. And then beds underscore av. Control and enter is quite sort of quite clear it's, it's clear something it that is the right answer and i'll explain why it's na and what that means but different to mutate which takes your whole data set and it adds to it so it's doing a couple of actions really it's like add column put this data in call this column this summarize is taking your data and squashing it to the the thing that you want to do and in this context we're using the mean average you could equally do just to show how nice this is, is use median, which actually comes from the stats package, a bit more complicated. And that's the median. They both come up with NA because what we've got in our data set are not applicable. So that's equivalent to null in SQL and in Excel, that would be, should be a blank cell. We have to be really careful when we're using statistics. And I know that I was a bit shaky on this for a long time, is if you put a zero in instead, like a holding place, that could be misconstrued as a true zero. And when it comes to averages, that will change your average. So it's best to leave these nulls. They could be NA. I think in um, we do see later it becomes NAN, which is not a number. So there's a lot of other kind of formats for NA in R than you get in, say, SQL, which is just null, missing, not, not available. The reason why we've got NA is because we have NAs in the data. So when you kind of like try to mean average and nothing, you get nothing. So it's kind of um, contaminated the data set. And it happens. This is a real world example. Now we can do either the two things you could do. You can filter your NAs just before, but actually what's nice about the function of mean is within it is a possibility of a parameter, which is NARM, which is remove your NAs equals true. The default is false, so it's always leaving them in. And if we change it to true, then you get your mean beds of 300. It's a bit of a meaningless statistic, really, because if you think about it, we've looked at all the dates and all of the trusts and then said, what's the mean average bed stay? And so it's a bit like over several years. So it's a bit strange. It doesn't have to be written out in the full word as true. You can just do T. I think. Um, bit of a debate. I think the thing is sometimes there's a debate on how you should and should not do things. What you should do is if you're working with some other people and if your team is working in R, you just have um, an agreement about how you write things. So in our team, we agreed to write everything out because it's just clearer for us. We don't use shorthand T and F, but if it's for yourself, consider your future self as being somebody who may not quite always, you know, you might forget these things. So consider your future self as a, as a team colleague and you might find as well, if you haven't already done so, because to be fair, people might have done this, you might find that you code differently if you're coding for somebody else. So I always try to code as if I'm going to write and share to somebody else. Don't always get it right. And it's interesting how sort of like precise you are when you go through your code, trying to pass it to somebody else. You comment it better and you write things out and you do your punctuation and everything. Anyway, so that was summarized with a few extra kind of coding bits.
and you get your single statistics. So I'm taking it all down, but it's quite meaningless. Na.rm, remove your NAs equals true. So we're going to take that question and say across all trusts makes a lot more sense. We're using the summary statistic of the mean that we've just created, but we're going to do it for each value of date not all trusts, sorry, we're going to take the dates. So of each, which makes more sense, doesn't it? Um, you could do it by trust actually, but we're going to do it by date. So in September, of all the trusts that are in there that have data in there, what was the mean average bed stay? Uh, not bed stay, that's something else. Mean average beds. I'm obsessed with bed stays, aren't I? So write it out, beds underscore data. I'm glad we've got autofill because my typing is terrible. Control, shift and M for Mike. Next line, and I'm going to write group by, then do the brackets and then run it. Now, group by is distinctly different to SQL, and it caught me out a few times because whereas in group by in SQL, it comes at the very, very end of your SQL script, um, in Excel terms, it kind of is part of your pivot. So you might not see that concept at all. It just sort of does it as part of pivoting and grouping to um, sets in a sense. You can, in SQL, you get the distinct view, don't you? When you sort of like list out all of the columns and you'll just get the most, um, you get one line per data set that is unique. That isn't what happens in this regard. Nothing has changed in our data. It looks exactly like beds underscore data. But there is a difference to it because if we, it should do it. I don't think it has there. Maybe I haven't done group by. Let me do beds data group by. Oh, it doesn't say anything. Group by, I haven't put anything in the group by. <laughs> That's why I need to put in the group by date. That's why it didn't say. Now, if I do that, it runs without it. But what I was looking for was this extra bit here in gray. Thankfully, I was looking for it because I'd forgotten it in my code. The first bit above was just saying, just your data. It's all, all just one data set, nothing's changed in it. But the second one where I put the group by date in is it tells me in the metadata. And what it's done is taken the data and grouped it by what you said, which is dates. So in mathematical terms, these are sets. We've just got a bucket here, that's September 2018, and a bucket here, it's September 2013. The reason we do this is because when we then add something afterwards, control shift and M, and then summarize mean beds equals mean equals not minus mean beds underscore average on the column. And then I'm going to remove those RMs equals true. I now get the application of the summary statistic of mean on each of those buckets, those sets, those grouped data, date forms. So we've now got from um, September 2013, the top 10, so we go down to December 2015, where you can see the mean beds, you can see it change over time actually, it reduces for all the trusts in those groups, buckets, sets. So group by is doing a meta thing to the table and then you're applying something to it afterwards. You can see the information of what you've done, which is what I was uh, finding when I sort of uh, applied it and then hadn't done it properly. You can see it in the information in your tibble, certainly, um, what you've applied to your data set. <coughs> now, I think when it comes to this section, uh, it has changed. So now the summary statistic has removed the group by, but I have had it previously. And I think if you've got several group buys, you can, um, it retains the, the subsequent ones, but not the first one. So it, you can get some funny results sometimes. You're doing your coding, you then produce something and you go, well, that doesn't make sense. And sometimes that's because the data is still grouped. So for example, you might produce an object through some script and at the very end of it you group by your data and then you refer to that object in a second load of data and you haven't ungrouped so it does some weird things. It's it's kind of nice to do ungroup by and that doesn't exist in SQL. You never group and then ungroup. So if I did another, um, oh, I don't think that's right. 
equals NA. That's a mistake, isn't it? If you just bear with me, I will um, write a note about that somewhere. Um, where am I doing it? So where am I going? Ungroup. Ungroup, it's an empty parameter. You don't need to say what it is you're ungrouping by. You just ungroup. I'm trying to get my word to work out stuff and then write in that thing with my mistake. OK. And if I run this, there's no change to the data. There's actually no change to the uh, um, the grouping either in terms of it. I think it was removed with su summarize. It was part of it before, but now it's been removed to make it easier. You can group by more than one thing. So if I did group by, um, is it org code? And let's see what happens there. But if I remove, ah, here we go. So I've got two group buys in there. So you can do more than one thing within, as I, as I mentioned before, more than one argument. And particularly with group by, you can do date, comma, separating it. And we've got organizational codes in here. I now get a message in my data bit that says summarizers group the output by date and you can override what you're doing it by. So I could group it by, I could summarize by more than one thing. So it's a bit more information. Anyway, the point being that if you get some very strange data points and you're a SQL user, just remember that group by can be ungrouped and it needs to sort of remove this metadata to your data table because it does get, or data frame, I should say, data table. I think I've just merged two things, smudged them together, data frame. Okay. I'm, I'm hoping that was okay, uh, but it's that summarize might be a new concept for people. And I did show median, and I know that the median function is, is just, just one word compared to if you use it in SQL or Excel, because you have to put it into a pivot to be able to use median. And median is very, very useful for some of the things we're doing in terms of healthcare and possibly even social care too. Next question then, which five organizations have the highest mean percentage bed occupancy over a five year period? Now, before I kind of break this down, I want to check with people this. I'm going to give you a moment to do a, a task to work through this. Just have a go at this and I'll be quiet. Now, the question to you and you please write this in the chat is whether you want a break beforehand or tackle this and have a break and then we'll go through it together afterwards. So I want hands up or smiley emojis or any emoji for having a break now. This is your chance to. So if it's silence, then we'll have it afterwards. I've got a little emoji from one. Oh, two. So having a break now. Three, four, five. Oh, it's kind of like an even split, I think. I mean, I'm, I'm not the quick at calculating. Let's go for a break now. Come back and then give you the opportunity to have a bit of silence from me to oh got a really cool one there okay now it's it's tipped towards break now <laughs> i'm going to pause this then let's pause the now okay welcome back everybody um what we're going to do now is tackle this question i'll give you a bit of a hint and then go a bit quiet for you to work through it and if anybody has any questions you can put those in the chat or speak up um before we do, just to sort of highlight, I did mention NAN is also equivalent. To, it's not equivalent to NA, but it, in terms of missing values, there's no data in here. This is what NAN is. NAN appears in the data set that we did with the summary statistic for mean, and that's not a number. So that means that there's something missing. It might be that there's nothing in there at all, actually, for those areas. So because we've removed them with NA.RM equals true. Quite a lot, actually, seem to have no detail at all. So we're going to look at this question, which is by which five organizations have the highest mean percentage bed occupancy? Oh, there's a good question before we go on to that about the NAs and NANs, which is how would you go about filling nulls as zero? You can do filling in details. I would really caution against it if you're going to do a statistic, as I say, in terms of numbers, making it a zero is like a true zero. So this was a 
a trust with zero beds like it existed and it had zero beds that would change your beds average so i would caution in that context but there are functions or verbs to fill in information as well so if you wanted to say fill down uh, like a category it might be a text like you want to fill down patient as a word patient a or something you can do that with some of the functions uh, they're, they're pretty good uh, don't cover them in this course but if you have any particular questions we can do that um, and there are also statistical things people do in terms of filling in NAs and nulls with statistical uh, I was gonna say wizardry it does feel like that isn't it where you're filling in but that's kind of like another step away so it is possible is the point but you have to be using it in the right context I think so in the question uh, percentage bed occupancy breaking it down we can create the new mutation variable of bed occupancy percentage bed occupancy which we've done before and then we can group by every organization now bear in mind if I do this data set you've got org code and org name and you'll you will get different results and then we'll explore why you get different results but you can use either summary statistic using summarize on the mean and then we're going to order it to find the highest. There's a lot going on in such a short question. It's actually one of the shortest questions. So the tip, which I completely ignored before when I was just typing away, is to do it step by step and see what you get. Does it look like you would expect it as you run it each line? Make sure it runs. Do you get any errors or warning messages? And although it says over to you, there is a hint here. I'll put that into the chat. It's kind of the order to think about your functions and your verbs as you go along. I'm going to give you five minutes just to tackle it. Don't worry if you don't finish it or if it gets stuck or whatever. It's just five minutes of being quiet with me and then I'll um, go through it with you. Uh, so it's 10.40 now, 10.45. I'll start talking again unless you have a question.
Okay, it's 10.45. I was just trying to answer the question about the zero. So you use a couple of um, replace NA, but you might need to use list. And so I was just messing around with that and not succeeding, but I, I will keep looking at it. Um, so it is possible to replace your NAs with zero. But you have to do a couple of other things with it. So uh, I'll get there in the end. But anyway, back to the question. Did anybody have any points from it that didn't make sense or um, didn't really f flow or got stuck or didn't really work? Or if you've even completed it, that'd be super fabulous. Um, I know I kind of struggle each time I look at it because there's so many st sections to it. Give you a chance to answer in the chat if people, are, people might still be working on it, to be fair because five minutes is not really a long time to go through this. It was good. Seem to have one organization with infinite, infinite mean bed occupancy. Ooh, it says INF, is that right? Inf, mm, okay. <laughs> yes, that's another thing that comes up in orange, inf. I think I get that too. I think I've got it, okay, great, that's brilliant. Just having a go can suddenly get you that, assume it was divided by zero somewhere. Yeah, it gets a bit mathematical and statistically, yeah. Inf is fun. Um, right, so I'm going to go to the answer and then work through it because otherwise it will be a bit slower, really will. Even though I've I've done this loads of times, it's a big question. Short, but big. Like the TARDIS. No, I can't believe I just referred to Doctor Who in a, in a, a code thing. Right, anyway, beds data is the object. Uh, piping it. Actually, while we're here, I'm just going to clear this because I was messing around here, wasn't I? There's a little... Um, clear console sweepy brush thing and if I do that it just clears the console tidies it up you'll find that in various other parts of your um, uh, screen so you've got the there's a clear objects in the top so you can be specific aware of where you clear things so instead of restarting your entire session you might just want to keep all the objects because our objects are fine I don't really want to get rid of those but just make it a bit clearer in the console and I want to just remove all those bits that I've done so beds underscore data is my object mutate so what i'm doing here is create i'm creating a new column adding in my new statistic or my new maths formula new data it doesn't have to be numbers it could be something else like you just use a string and um i'm changing the layout of the data frame i really wanted to say data table again like i've created something new here perk oc is the name of the column that i'm creating i'm determining it Beds av is the detail. I'll just double tick click that so you can see the table. Data frame even. Occupancy average divided by beds average. Run that. Got a new column. So we did that one before. That was fine. Control shift and M for the next line. I'm going to do this group by. And as I said, you could use org code or org name. I'm going to use org name and we will explore. If you use code, that's fine. It came up in a previous um, training course, which was really good. This is the point when you get a lot of different people looking at the same thing. You can find out lots of interesting things, even though they're always there. There are differences between the org codes and org names. So you will get different numbers out of it. I'm using org name and all it's doing is putting the group by metadata to the groups it's bucketing them together but not actually changing the data itself i change the data though by adding my summarize in it so my summarize statistic which i'm going to name mean poc and it doesn't have to be mean poc per short for percentage occupancy it could be anything that you want but just try and make it meaningful mean now the mean is of the previously created column at the end which i've got perk oc lots of puzz and things and I think if I run that, it doesn't matter about the na.rm equals true because I think what's happening in the data is where we've got these names like Aintree University Hospital, they're all NA. I, I, maybe they don't actually have any um, beds, but they list they were listed in the data set. So it's not unless actually maybe, oh, no, that's not true. I was just thinking about it. Maybe there is an NA in there and it kind of obliterates the other information. So it works, but we have to be careful because even then I was just forgetting, I might be over, um, oh, I'm getting it in the wrong bracket, uh, trying to think of two things at the same time there. I might be removing some of the numbers because I'm, I'm making a mean statistic in those organizational names 
where there's an NA existing. So if I do NA dot RM dot dot RM equals true, I keep doing a comma. And now I get not a number. So these do look like they had nothing in them. So I didn't lose anything, but that's only in the top 10. So there might be some where in the data that I could have removed all of the information from it because I left in rm, na.rm equals false as default. Control shift and M for the pipe and arrange. So we need to order it in a descending order, mean POC. Control and enter always, I, I, I use my shortcut, short keyboard shortcuts. And so I've now got this saying Barnett, Enfield and Harringay mental health as the top with mean percentage occupancy of 98. If I change that to org code, you'll find it is still RRP, which might be the same trust, I'm not familiar with the names and the codes between them. Now, Going back to that point that I made about what do these numbers represent? So these are mean percentage occupancies, but is this a percentage of a big number or a small number? It's going to have a have a bit of an impact to it. Uh, in this context, it's not things. It's this. It's a data point. How much data is behind it, which is quite interesting for statistics. How confident are we or could we be that this is true? In that if we've got lots of data points, we're more likely to get a truer value than if we've got fewer. So it's nice to see the difference as well. And the way you can do that is the another um, function. And it also shows how summarize can have multiple things in it. So at the moment I'm doing mean POC, I can either do it, you might see it in two ways actually. This display on the left is one particular way where you add another argument in, a comma and then keep going. But you equally might see other people rewrite it out and that's absolutely fine. Again, it's what is dependent on your kind of like team agreed coding standards, whether you write everything out explicitly. So you could do multiple filters. You go filter by column A, filter by column B, and filter by column C and list it out specifically. Or you can do this where you do a comma and then add in a num another summary statistic. And this one, I'm calling it number, which could be a terrible column name but the function is just N with brackets. When I do control and enter for that, I'll share the code so that you get, oh, I didn't share the code before with the answer. So this is with the answer. So if it didn't, it didn't work for you, you can kind of try and do spot the difference between what you've written and what's on there. And sometimes it might just be a comma or a bracket or mixed case sometimes catches people out or misspellings like I've got like beds, not beds, means and beds very easy to do. The second code I'm going to share has the number equals n. So n is a function and it's a very useful one and it gives you the number of, in this case, it's observation points. I use number a lot for say contacts or wards or patients. The number of patients to the contacts matters to me as much as the number of contacts because it could be one patient has lots of contacts and several others have only a few gives you a bit more information about the in the data that you're doing, even though you've got a summary statistic here. So it's showing in this regard that Barnett, Enfield and Haringey mental health are dis different, very different. One's got 21 um, points of data to be um, sort of manipulated and the other one's only got three. So that's actually very interesting. The other thing that kind of came out of this, which I referred to before with this difference with the org name and the org code, it, we can explore that a bit as well. So um, if I do beds underscore data again, and the other thing we can do is group by in this context, org code, control shift and M again for the pipe. And then I'm gonna summarize by distinct number. And I like distinct a lot more, which is n distinct as a function. And then you can say what it is you want. So I want org name in here. And when I do that, I can, I do it for patients, for example. Um, I'm not counting the numbers of times that they appear. I'm just counting the one patient. So if I had a data set of 2000 contacts, and I want to know how many patients this is actually referring to. I don't want to count every time that they appear because that would be 2000. I want to see if it was 20 people 
or 200 or something else. So n distinct gives me the distinct number in this context of names to the codes. So the codes are repeated, but with different names. And you can see here one particular one, which is just lucky, really, because this is the top 10, R1K. If we didn't have that, if we were still suspicious that there were more and we're only seeing the top 10 out of 60 odd observations, is it, was it 4,555? Yeah, 58. That's a lot to kind of scroll through. If I do control shift and M, so this was a puzzle that I just like, let's explore this. And then you can filter by distinct number, which is the one that I've just created. So I can find it here in my list, tab it so it fills it in. Greater than one. I only want those that appear more than once. And there's a few. There's 10 here with 12 more rows. That's a lot. Let's find the greatest at the, you know, the, the most, because that's just interesting. And then we can maybe filter it a bit more in a sense. Descending, so we're using the arrange function, descending function, distinct number. So all the while we're using this new summary statistic that I've created as part of this code. It didn't exist from the original data. And now we've got two trusts, RDE and RTG, that have three names to them. I'll share that code with you. And before I go on to select, I'm going to look at my beds underscore data and show you a couple of views that you can do in this, which I find really useful. So as we've been coding all of our views and looking and filters and things, our studio has made it quite easy as well to do it within the tab view of the data set. If I make it bigger, Along the top, you have the arrows so that you can go between your tabs. And in fact, actually, no, it's, it's stuck because I've, ex I've, I've popped it out. I didn't realize that. I was just testing it. I wasn't sure. You have a filter um, symbol, which is similar to Excel's filter symbol. And it means that you can filter. You can't filter by date for some reason. That happens a bit. And I'm not sure that's an R Studio thing. But you can filter by org code, org name, and beds average. So you could actually, with these toggles to the names of them, as we were doing before, is click on it. It does the ascending automatically. And then if you click on it again for beds average, you can get descending in your view, much more similar to those who use Excel. And I forget it's not available in SQL Server and SSMS. And I really miss that in my output. So I don't need to code this. I can just look and explore my data. If I just put this over. Ah, somebody suggests, and I do wonder if this is true too. Yes, probably. Um, you can't filter by date because our studio doesn't recognize the date format as it's not American style. It could be that, uh, I, need to, I need to explore that a bit. That's that's a very good point. I'm gonna push this over. Ah, oh, yeah, that's what I want. I want to see RDE. I don't know what RDE means, you know, who that would refer to. So in my org underscore code, I'm gonna write RDE. And I get Colchester Hospitals Universities and they became a foundation trust in June, the June quarter. And then they were perhaps merged with East Suffolk and North Essex, but retained the code of RDE. That explains a bit, doesn't it? And if I do RTG, we get Derby Hospitals, Derby Teaching Hospitals and University Hospitals of Derby and Burton. They all have NA in them, but in that particular one, RDE, did they? They had numbers, RDE, RTG. Oh, they all have, oh, but RTF, RTG. Yeah, they both have zero in them. Interesting. But exploring your data like that can be quite helpful between the two things, which is why you might have got different orders for your numbers when they came out. Is that okay? Because I've kind of taken Directed exploration to, oh, here's a few other things that you will probably find really useful and throw those in there and kind of gone off on a tangent just to explore the data because it's not always very obvious what we're working with, even though this is um, familiar data. And it was just lucky that somebody pointed this out to me. So I went to a rabbit hole kind of thing and used those functions to explore that data a bit further. Great. OK, select. This is a wonderful simple function you kind of 
you are using already if you're using Excel and SQL. I, I refer to these two a lot because I don't really use the other systems, but I'm pretty sure they might have select if you're doing it in like data frames, table kind of work in them. If I write it out, you'll recognize it, beds underscore data, control shift and M, and you're selecting. I suppose in Excel, you're pointing and clicking and copying and pasting, but this would just be listing out your columns that you want, org name, code and org name, control and enter. There you go, just highlighting two of them, similar to the people who use SQL. But you can, and I think this is a, this is key point that's lacking in SQL is you can deselect. So if I take my object ben, beds underscore data, control shift and M for the pipe, select and minus org code, and then control and enter, I get my data set, but without the org code anymore, which you might not always want. This is a very small data set in some regards, but if you had, and I've got some data tables or data tables yeah tables in SQL servers which are just columns and columns 20 30 columns long and I just want to remove one of them because it's just not necessary for something tidy it up a bit you have to list all 19 and just to remove the 20th this makes it a lot easier you can remove a column just by saying minus the other thing you can do with your select is to select by the or with the, the position, sorry, of your data set, which is very familiar to those who wish to learn or have learned a bit of base R. You do it by the order, uh, not the order, the position. So I keep saying order and I mean position. So if I write beds underscore data, control shift and M for pipe, select. I'm going to do two to four because whenever I say one to three, it sounds like I'm saying one, two, three, which doesn't make sense. If I say two and three, I'm picking out the columns two and three. Now this is really useful when people change the column header. It, it changes over time and you you know it will always be there, but it just, for some reason, it, it, I don't know why, they always, there's always something, isn't there, when you're cleaning a data that some, somebody changes something. It's, I'd be hesitant to use it all the time because it's not so meaningful. And um, it yeah, so if you're just kind of scanning it, you, I don't know but it depends on what's suitable for you and what your data set is as well. So it is quite useful to do it by position. It saves you doing, if I do two to four, you don't have to list it out two, three, four, or one, two, three, or any of those. You have you could just do two to 25. So you could actually chop it up, which is nice. And another one, which is a function within a function, you'll find this a lot, functions inside functions. We've been doing that already, but this is another one taking the object, piping to the next line, select org name. So if I just show you what I'm doing step by step, the beds data has date, org code, org name, beds average, occupancy average. Now you might want the org name to be the first column. And that's what I've done here with the select. I've said select org name. If I just ran that, I would just get org name on its own. But if I wanted org name to be moved to the beginning as I said before if you do a mutation and you create something it always goes to the end of your database columns or not database um data frame columns if you wanted it to be the first one like id I always forget to put the id in and then I think oh that's a really useful thing it comes in at the end and I want it in the first column typing it out and then everything you might have already done this while I was talking it's an empty um function in a sense it just runs and what it does is brings everything else with it it doesn't repeat so you don't get date org code org name which was the original position and then repeated at the beginning it just moves it and that's nice and useful as well in that you can reorder your columns very very easily there is a a function i don't use as well very often but i think it could be useful called reorder so there's a number of things that are available. We're only really showing you a few of them here, but you can, if you have a question like, can I do this? And we've had a couple today. Chances are you could, and it's just finding how to get that answer. And we'll cover that in a bit anyway, about how to sort of direct your questions in your subjects. Right, before I go on to the next bit, which is a new kind of terminology of vectors, anything that's cropped up from that? for clarification or questions or not working. 
all silent. Very good. OK, right. Not D player. Kind of seen already. I sort of snuck it in that a, a few of the functions we were using were from other packages. Seemingly, you know, just seamlessly, they just work with them. Base R works. We looked at the stats. I didn't realize median is from a stats package. But this other thing is like a different concept of how your data is formed. And that's very, very useful within dplyr as well. Something called vectors. And you do see that in SQL, but again, it's really, really small and uh, you'll see it as we go along, but it isn't something that was ever something I knew the name of. I guess it's like when you learn English, you just you learn or language, any language as a child, you don't know what the grammar of it is, why it's, you know, that this is a verb. When you say the words, you just know that, that that's the best place for them. So the vectors, there is a link there to find out more about them. Just to kind of give it some context, I didn't really know this. I kind of knew how to use them before I knew what they were. They were always the same data structure in R. Um, in this context, C at the beginning of these brackets is, people say concatenate, I've seen, but concatenate is more like squashing together in other languages and SQL and Excel are the prime ones for that. But if you think of it in terms of combine, I'm saying I want a list. Now, the difficulty I get to this point is that list is another concept in R. In kind of like plain English, this is what it feels like I'm using here is a list of numbers, text, and if I mix it together, it defaults to text because it can't reconcile text being numbers. I'll try and use a different kind of thing. I'll wince every time I say um, list because it feels natural to say that, but it's not the correct way to refer to it. So the vector, I've copied them over. I'll copy them into the chat for you to have a go as well. In the line 64, as I've got here, which has C for combined brackets and then three numbers listed, listed, hmm? notice how I just use listed, control and enter to run it. It appears in the console. It shows you the code that I run in purple with the arrow to the right. And then underneath it's got this one in square brackets and then numbers. So I think that is a list now. It's made it a list. I think I've got that correctly. If I do the text line, which is line 65, you can see the C with the brackets and all of the things that I've typed out and run with bed stuff and patient words, and they're all in quotations. And they appear underneath listed as bed staff and patients in text. If you mix them together, though, so this line that I've just run 66 has beds, a number and then text patients, it makes it all text. Like the dates, if it can't reconcile it, it can't recognize it, it goes text because text is universal. Text can be used for all sorts of things. That's the kind of like underlying concept of vectors as in they're all the same thing. If you mix them, they become string text. Uh, yeah, text. There was another word I was using as well and I've forgotten it now. I've put string in there instead. It becomes very useful when we're looking to filter by more than one thing. So I, I was running this course and I realized that in SQL, I do this slide a lot where I'm not just looking for one trust, for example, I'm looking for multiple trusts. And in SQL, if people are familiar with this, you use where column in and then brackets. And these brackets where you then list out what it is you're looking for. And it might be like uh, one, two, three, or or dates or whatever. So it's a string of dates, a series of strings, or not in if you want to exclude them. I was using that a lot in SQL and I wanted to use it in R. So you can move between the languages that you're familiar with and go, I do this here, how do I do it now? And I found that I was using it in this thing with C. So it's the same kind of brackets around it that you get in SQL, but the C is for combine. I'll write it out, though, because not everybody uses SQL as well. So if we do beds underscore data, which is your object, very familiar, familiar with this, control shift and M for pipe and filter org. <laughs> That's an interesting way of spelling org with a number. And in is this percentage and then in and then another percentage. And I can type out, I'm going to copy it, actually, because I always get that bit wrong. There's a lot of typing to do there and then a bracket to close it. If I run this, I'm looking for Bradford District Care Trust. If I give it a bit more space, I think you can see it's got trust at the top and at the bottom of that data set that shows 
on my console, you can see Bradford District Care. So I'm getting them both together. Now that was quite straightforward. I picked that up quite quickly. You've got this percentage in percentage, which is rep it's, it's kind of equivalent to in if you're using SQL, but not in is slightly different and it doesn't change anything to do with your in here in the middle, which is the thing that caught me out. I didn't realize until I moved to another language how frequently I use negative, even though it's not really that good in SQL. You need to put before your org name, your column name, an exclamation mark to represent the not. So it's in the kind of like the wrong place. It feels like it's it's a bit sooner, isn't it? So it's not in this column in positive. Does it match? Yes or no? And now we don't get anything to do with Bradford District as it is there. Um, I'll share that code as well. If you find this kind of thing quite interesting, which is where I was going with it as well, you might want to find parts of Word. You might want to just say, can I match Bradford, but not the other bits. And there are packages that we're not going to cover today, but I would certainly direct you to called string R. So it's like all one word that, that tend to have a play on the R name, the, the R. It's not really a name, is it? The, the letter in your like D ply R and um, or D player. Um, String R and string I, string E in a sense. I'll put those in the chat. Have a look at those. And they're really nice uh, packages and they work. They are part of our studio's kind of suite of, they're not part of Tidyverse, but they work really well with Tidyverse, string R. So they're kind of like a next stage for your data analytics and coding, but really nice. So I think what you'll find hopefully is that you'll get to these questions and go, but I want to do this next. And that's you learning and that's great because you won't learn everything in one day at all. Any questions for this, particularly as I've thrown in a bit of SQL, so that's really hopefully very familiar to people who are SQL users, but it might still be new to people, or you might have never touched SQL and now it's like, oh, now I know two languages. <laughs> I've got R oh, and a bit of SQL thrown in. And that's the end of the manipulation bit. I told you I, I could talk about that one for a while. Naming objects is the name, next part. <clears throat> so I'm going to go on to new line. I will um, keep going. Right, we are going to revisit our dplyr session. So we didn't, we sometimes have a break at that point. So it's kind of like going back, but we didn't have the break. We had it a bit before. I'm going to copy this code because it's been above. But if I just run that, you get the same number. Oh, you get different numbers because I did it by date. No, I got the same numbers. What I've got on the code here is taking the beds data, grouping it by date, and then summary statistic of mean beds by each of those dates, removing all the NAs. And so we get just numbers. In a sense, we've filtered it. And if we then wanted to visualize this information, we can combine it with ggplot2 really easily. It's all been loaded anyway as part of Tidyverse, so ggplot2 should be available to you as well. And if I just write around it, ggplot, I'm going to highlight the entire code and put an open bracket, and it puts the closed bracket at the end of it. I've got my ggplot. If I just run that, control and enter, I get my blank screen, as you got before, in my plots in the bottom right-hand quadrant of the RStudio. It's running, but it's not showing anything because I've just given it the data. So if I wrote in here, I think it might come in the next slide, data equals, that's what I'm running. I'm saying this is my data. And if I put the plus at the end, which is the next layer, and put geom point, and this is where I'm saying my aesthetics, x equals date, y equals mean beds, which is what I've created, then we get a strange chart, really with it all sort of like, it looks like it's clustered really, doesn't it? Like right at the top and right at the bottom, right at the top left and down at the bottom right with some dots. It's quite bulky really having the two together. I mean, this is quite a short amount of code with the data, uh, but it could be like lines and lines long. When you're tidying your data, it could be, um, yeah, I'm just thinking of some of my code. It runs into hundreds of lines sometimes with tidying it. And when you combine the two, which you can do, it can be difficult to know what's wrong if something breaks. Is it the ggplot part or is it the data part? Um, is it the, the combination of the two together? It gets a bit murky. It's possible to do, but it is a bit tricky to 
um, debug, as they say. So keep the wrangling separately. What is nice to do, um, I've seen others do it, I tend not to, is you can flow one into the other. So uh, one of the things you might have noticed is that we've got this difference in the pipes and the plus. And that was one of those historic things where the two packages were created separately. One used the pipe for the and then, and the other one, the ggplot used plus for layers. And I think I've seen Hadley Wickham say that, you know, in hindsight, it should have been the same thing, but they just developed and have now this expectation of being something different. So they've left them to be separate, but they do work together. And you can pipe data into a chart. It needs a bit of fiddling with it, but I like to keep mine separate. Right, totally separate. Because for me, it makes it readable and um, debuggable. It's much easier to debug. But what we can do with that is, in a sense, um, I'm thinking this is the same for Excel as well, is create a temporary table. So you're creating your data in an object that looks like it does up here when you first import it and it has a name attached to it. So in this context, we, we can take this chunk of beds data. I'm going to put that under line 278. So if I run that, you just get your data and I can create a name. I'm going to just type it out, beds, ooh, it could be anything, but that's not even real English, beds, TS for time series, and then a funny symbol. And then if I run that, control and enter, I don't get my any code in the console. But, ooh, now I do. <laughs> I get the code that I've run because I hadn't run it, but no output in the console. And I've now got a third object in my environment. If I just open it up, you can see beds underscore TS has appeared as an object. The screen is referring to, the slide refers to good object names. And as I said before, with your column names, it's best to move away from things that are just, they are super quick to go X and Y and stuff like that. It, it, it is useful, but it can be a bit tricky for future you or other people to sort of pick up what it is. Naming objects can be quite tricky too, need them to be descriptive, like this is beds underscore TS for time series, short-ish, they can get a bit longer, but the consistency is key because I look at my old code and I was completely inconsistent of how I did it and i um, not too pr proud of myself when I look back at that. So try to be consistent and it takes practice and it helps when you're working with other people too. So if you do something wrong, do it consistently wrong in a sense, in terms of naming conventions. Interestingly, this is a funny symbol. Um, you can use equals and that will do the same thing. It's run the code and um, you can't see the change because I've just, it's still in an object. People conventionally don't use equals necessarily with R, uh, but you can do, is all I'll say. But if you want to use this operator, it came from the original keyboards that I think people were using when they used S and then maybe when they moved in, that was the proprietary software before R. And then when they used R, there was an actual key that was this arrow to the left and a hyphen next to it. You can use a shortcut, Alt minus, and that's very much like the Magritar pipe with the percentage arrow to the right and percentage because it puts the spaces around it as well. So um, if you just squish it all together as I've got there, and if I do, oh, I need my two hands to do this, alt and minus, it pushes my words apart and puts in the assign operator, as they call it. So that's what it's equivalent to, like an equals assign operator. I suppose as maybe in, oh, I'm doing enter and I need to do a key down. The slide here is referencing what I've pointed out already, that it comes up as an object in the environment and you can open it up like any of the other things that we've done before. So I can put it into my script just as the object name, control and enter and it will show me the data just on this occasion because it's already pre-done the date and the mean bed. So it's become an object in its own right. I can also explore the data using the arrow to see what's in there. So I've got date, it tells me it's a date format, mean beds, it tells me it's number. And I can also select it and view it as its own tab. So you can do all of the things you did before because that's what it is, it's an object. So if we return back to the plot, which had the combined information of um, dplyr long, it, not that long, but it could be really long code 
to create the object and then the plotting around it, we can be really nice now and just go, okay, ggplot data equals beds ts because it's a ta it's a temporary table in a sense plus and it's temporary because it doesn't exist outside of the program geom underscore point aes x equals date y equals mean beds uh, it doesn't find it don't know why ah, that's a shame and i get my chart again so if i just clear that clear all my plots and then run it again it will appear and now I'm just referring to one word, which makes it a lot clearer to see it's only two lines of code now on the screen. On my other screen, I've put some um, breaks on it so that it fits on the screen. Whereas the other one, there was a lot there to sort of break into and lots of words. And I'm going to give you uh, a minute or two for me to drink my tea and also for you to have a go. I want you to explore what a plot would look like when you name it as an object. It has a surprising effect in one of the areas. So I want you to create it, create this plot. So give this a name, however you want to name it and, and however you want to go about it. And then look at it and try and look at it in multiple ways. As I mentioned before, there's the environment and then there's also within your editor. Have a go um, and then I will go through it step by step as to what you hopefully will have seen. And if you haven't, then I can just sort of introduce it. I'm gonna be quiet now, give you some space. It's 11.21. I'm going to start talking about 11.22-ish. A minute seems a long time, doesn't it? Depending on where you start your silence in, in the minute. Right. So I've got my GG plot here. I can call it plot. It's a terrible name, but I'm going to write it plot. I'm going to do alt and minus, which puts in the assign operator. I could use equals, as I said, but I'm going to use the kind of conventional R. I'm going to do control and enter to run it. As I did before, it appears in the code. It's run in the console because everything you write in the editor goes to the console to run. And I can see my code that I've done. It's fine. And I've got this plot up at the top in the environment saying list of nine. So that's that reference to list as well. If you click on it, like you're opening up before we looked at the data sets as a tab in itself, you can see what's in those lists. And it's kind of goldigook to me anyway. So you've got data and layers. So this is the underlying stuff that's in the chart. So you can see the data here, that's interesting. And the layers and the scales and the mapping. And that might be used by people, but I don't use it myself. Um, not in this context anyway. That's a lot, that's the information that's underneath your chart. I'm sure that exists in Excel, but it might be more familiar to the people. B VBA, I don't know. There must be some code underneath the charts, but we tend to get the upper level really, don't we, with the click and drop. That's not quite what you were looking for, but it's useful to know that's what the plot looks like. But if I refer to the plot, either in the editor or the console, because everything goes to the console, I could just put it there directly and do control and enter. Then I get my plot. If I just remove my sweepy brush and then do my plot, then you can see it's back as a plot with these kind of, oh, there are, it looks like there's three clusters really, doesn't there? Different years. And so that's, the, you can reference your plot in other code or most predominantly within your R markdown. So before when I was saying how you can export your charts and then copy and paste them into say Word or Excel or PowerPoint is quite common. You can then use your R markdown to do that instead, and you'll refer to your object as your plot. But it can be a bit sort of disorientating when you open it and you're not viewing it as its own plot. You're seeing the underlying information, which is nice, but it can be a bit shocking. 
solution. Right, naming style. As I said about consistency, this is where I really fell short quite early on. So I would mix up the way I sort of did the, the names of things because SQL and Excel and maybe some other products, maybe Power Boy up BI, certainly, um, they're quite uh, relaxed about how you name things and you can have spaces and you can do mixed cases and things. But I noticed particularly with R, and I'm sure this is with other programming languages like Python, there are accepted ways of doing your naming convention and they have names. I didn't realize this. So a common way of doing your naming convention, how you do your uppercase and lowercase case is what I'm referring to, is uh, in R is something called camel case, where the first word is always all lowercase, and then subsequent words thereafter have one capitalized at the beginning. That can look a bit strange. I mean, um, if you're thinking about things like NHS, we've got a, a package called NHS R data set. So having the NHS in all lowercase, even though it's an acronym, felt a bit strange, but that would be the convention, although we've gone with capitals for it. But it's a bit like that. It's a bit strange. So in my team, we've agreed not to use that particular one because one particular member found it really, really tricky. And she prefers Pascal case. And so do I actually now, because now that it was introduced to me, we write it like you would do, I hope, a hashtag on Twitter or some other social media things where if you put the capital at the beginning of each word, it makes it easier to read, but it also makes it so much easier for screen readers because it can read that this is a distinct word just squashed together. When you have a whole, whole string of lowercase, it makes it really tricky. If you wanted to have all lowercase, which is another familiar um, way of doing your object naming, snake case is a way of doing it where you have your spaces between it with an underscore. At this point, I'll say there's a really good package as well called Janitor. Um, which helps you tidy up a lot of the, I'll put the um, the name janitor in the chat as well. It does a lot of cleaning up of things like Excel, um, which takes big long columns, which have lots of spaces and things and uppercase, lowercase, and it just will make it all snake case, just automatically with a, a small, with one verb function, for example. And that makes it all kind of like uniformly R related. A kebab case is another one which doesn't work in R scripts, but I'm mentioning it because it is more commonly used in R markdown. If I were to change this beds underscore TS, which is snake case, and put hyphen TS instead, it's not that clear, but it's a blue uh, format text in the editor because it's seeing it as a, a mod, um, um, some, mod, not multiplication, it's a, a minus sign. But it is really useful and is used a lot within our markdown. And I like the way it's got a name, kebab case. I think in SQL, we just used uh, mixed cases and there was no issue with that because SQL servers, certainly the ones that we use, are agnostic to that. But as, I, as you might have encountered in some of your coding now, R is very, very precise with whether it's an uppercase or a lowercase. And that was a very short bit about naming. And I think sometimes what I've discovered certainly is that I was doing these things already. I just didn't know that they had some context, names, grammar, these kind of rules around things. Um, so it's just nice to know, to refresh it. So I might just be refreshing your memories from other things that you currently do already or have done in the past. Which brings me to relational data. Now, this is a very interesting one because at the moment we've been working with just one single table. I was just thinking, yeah, one single table. But we often, um, in Excel and in SQL, Power BI, or possibly Clicks and Tableau, is bring tables together to get more information, sort of multi-dimensional type of data sets. And in SQL, we would use joins. And in Excel, it could be VLOOKUPs. H lookup and there's a new one which I've never used X lookup which seems to be going towards more like the SQL relational database joins because they're very powerful. We'll focus on uh, it says we'll focus on left joins but actually I threw in a few other joins because there was a lot of interesting things you can do with them but we will go through them step by step. Um, in SQL terms this is more like a, a VLOOKUP as well, but SQL is even more powerful than VLOOKUP in that you can join two tables together 
but in SQL and in R, which is very, very similar in the construct and the concept, you can select which column it is that you're joining on. Whereas VLOOKUP, you have to put it in the actual position for it to do the join for you. XLOOKUP may be that um, extension into the being able to select your column. I'm not sure because I haven't done it myself. So this nice image that's kind of showing up here is taking the left, the two tables. The left table has data that matches to the right table on the column um, names and the uh, IDs. And where it doesn't match, it drops the right data. So four on the right doesn't match to anything on the left. So it goes. But three on the left doesn't match to anything, but it is retained. It, it would have something null here at the little square at the bottom. So that is possibly incredibly familiar to those who use SQL Server joins. And you must be doing, if you do, you probably do that quite a lot. The joins we won't cover are exactly the same. In a join where you take your two tables and if they don't match, no, it, it, I just wonder if I do that in the next one, it just drops them. So really, for those who are SQL users, any join that you use in SQL exists in R, which is really nice. There are a couple of extra ones which I will cover that are kind of R specific. The concept exists in SQL, but it's not in join. So I will cover those because they're really powerful and they're also really useful. And it's nice for those who, um, so you all, all learn that together, even depending, no matter what your background is. But we're going to work through these relational database ones or database ones, data. I want to say data table, data. I'll just stop with data. These relational data tables, we're going to use two, uh, three, sorry, files. So first of all, I'll go to a new um, script. So it's all nice and clean. I'm going to do control, shift and alt and N, I nearly forgot, to do a new script. So it's a bit tidier. Just clear it down there as well. I'm going to clear my um, objects in my environment as well, just to make it a bit clearer. You don't have to do that yourself, but it's just for me to make it clearer for you. And then I'm going to search for these files that are saying please import, which are down at the very bottom, starting with T, TB underscore for all three of them, cases, new table and pop CSV files. They're all pre-tidied. They're just small subsets of information. So if you click on them, so just select it with your left button of your mouse, if you're a mouse user, Ah, oh, mine's a bit squashed. And then choose import data set dot, dot, dot. And then just go to import. It will just run those three lines of code and open up the table with the view at the bottom here. So I've got TB underscore cases thrown in there. And now I'm going to go to table new. No, TB underscore new table, import data set dot, dot, dot. The data's fine. I know it is. So just import, import away. And it opens up. Actually, I will keep that one open. And TB underscore pop import data set and just import it. So it's run those three lines every time. It, it, it did the library read. Ah, oh, that's fine. It was already in, uh, imported. Uh, not imported. I keep saying imported. Loaded as part of tidyverse, but that's fine. It just it won't affect it at all. And then imported it and then opened it up as a tab to view. Just to make sure. Everybody's got those files and has imported them. A couple of seconds while well, people are probably just clicking and dropping and things and all OK. Good. OK. I'm going to go back to my blank script. And I'm going to show you the left join using these tables. So I'm going to join TB cases, which I'll move. Actually, that's the other thing you can do. You can kind of move where your tabs are. I'm going to put my TB cases here. I'm going to move my TB pop into the middle so I can just flip between them a bit more easily. TB cases has got country year and cases in the columns and TB pop for population has got country year and population. Different information, different numbers. One's cases, one's population. TB cases is the main table on the left. Just for good practice, it's already loaded, but I'm going to write library tidyverse. Just make a point that it's good practice to put it at the top of your script. TB underscore cases is the left control shift and M, which you recognize as a pipe now, which means and then left join comes up as an option straight off. If I do the tab, you can see it's from dplyr. It gives you some other options in a join left join. Oh, there'll be right join as well. Let's see if I can get that to, no, can never get that to work. 
left join. I'll just do left join. TB underscore pop, which is the right hand table. A second argument, which is by equals in quotation marks country. Now, <coughs> country matches in the two data sets. And unlike in SQL where you have to be explicit, you have to say, you'd have to say country equals country, for example. You don't have to do that in this context of left join in dplyr. But I did point out here, maybe you saw it, we've got year in cases, no, not year, country and year, and we've got country and year and pop, and only one of the columns of information changes. So there's a bit of a hint there. I'm not going to ask you, um, but you can, uh, you can do it. You, you would need to join it by two columns because if you don't, which is what we've done here, it uh, gives you duplicates. So 1999 for Afghanistan and Brazil that we can see on this top 10 has been repeated. So the cases are repeated for 1999, 2000, 2001, 2002, because we need to, to match the year to the year as well. So in R, if you have the same named column, and this is very distinct, it has to be the same name, and it can't differentiate between the two, it puts a dot X and a dot Y at the end of it. So you can see this is the first one, this one's the second one. And if you've got another one, you can keep going. And like in SQL, not possible with VLOOKUP, but possibly with XLOOKUP, you can join on multiple columns. And so what we need to do is, oh, duplicates, yes, I've been saying about duplicates. We need to join by two columns, both country and year. So nicely, kind of harking back to the vectors, this is why vectors become really important in your code in dplyr and many other packages you may use. It's very, very powerful, is it's more than one thing that you're trying to do. And so we need to join by, oh, I was going ahead of myself, country and year. So you can see this C combine again. I'm going to just copy that. And I'm going to remove the country and type it in there. I'll share that code with you. And then run that. And the top 10 now, oh, it's top 16 because it's not a tibble. Oh, it is a tibble, but it's showing 16. That's interesting. I'm now only getting Afghanistan 1999 once and Brazil once. So there's a four, four countries here, Afghanistan, Brazil, China, and Denmark. They all appear once in each year because I've now only got one column of year. Now the next slide to do the default is uh, just to highlight how sort of lazy you can be when you use um, R. It's a good thing and it can be a bad thing, but I quite like this. Control, Shift, and M for the pipe. And then if I wrote left join, I just wrote TB pop and then control and enter. I haven't said what to join by, been really kind of like sloppy. And it's done it for me because it matches them automatically. It goes, well, this is a year, this is a year, that matches, that's a country, and that's a country, that matches. But you also get the code written above it. So you could have a go, get these two massive tables, if you have two tables, join them together, or data frames as they would be in R, join them together, find out what they join on, and then throw that into your TB cases into your code. And as you can see, it's exactly the same. It would be the same if I put a comma in. Oops, oops, control Z. It's the same. But what you can do is just then change that. You don't have to keep it. You could just remove it. So you could throw two tables together, see what matches, and then just select one or two that you need. So it's nice sort of lazy coding. And even if you have one item in your C, combine vector, it will work as well. I'm going to do different names in the next one, but there was a question about, can you do a self-join? Yes, you can. I don't know what that would be called necessarily, but I think that's when you're joining your table to it, itself. So your left table is also your right table. Yes, you can. And you can change your right table as well. And I'll show you that as we go along that you can sort of manipulate your table, what you can see in it, what you could select. So you could say, for example, my left table has all of this information about patients and my right table is just the patient with their date of birth. So I've manipulated that same table, but I've reduced it to something like maybe they appear twice or something and you could do a self-join. Absolutely, you can do that in dplyr. I hope I haven't lost people because that was going off on a bit like, Ugh. so if you've got some code and you want to sort of like match it to what you're doing in another language, 
it's possibly possible and um, it'd be fun to do. I like translations between two languages. Joining with different names though, because we've got this uh, flexibility, let's say, with joins in dplyr, where you don't have to be explicit, does become very important when you've got different names. Now, these ones are contrived names like country equals place and year equals year. Um, as I pointed out really with the, uh, a few times now with the capitalization matters in uh, dplyr, in R generally, sorry. Uh, things like NHS number, for example, if you had NHS number and it was all lowercase all together, and then some of them were capitalized NHS and number, as a human, you'd read it and go, that's the same data, but the R program doesn't see that. It sees them as distinct. So you sometimes have to be explicit. And if I do that in this example, so TB underscore cases, control shift and M for the pipe for the and then. Next line would be left join TB new table. And this is a really terrible uh, contrived table that I created, which is just place, which is basically country, year, which is a uh, badly formed year, and first letter. First letter being the first letter of the country name. It's very contrived. And then if I did by equals C, I'm just copying the C, aren't I? So it's by country and year. Of course, that won't work. I'll run it just to show, prove it. It says the problem with country and year. So there's problems with those because they, they don't match. They're not distinct enough. But within the C combine vector, I can write country equals place and be very explicit about it. And year equals year. I've shared the code with you in um, the chat, but the point about this as well is you must be careful about the order you give it within the C part. SQL is ambiguous whichever way you do it, sorry, it should be country, but R and dplyr, well dplyr really, and, and it's dplyr, isn't. So I've put, I've switched place and country. So place is from the right side and country is from the left. The order within the vector matters and it breaks if you don't have it the right way around. And for the life of me, I always forget this and I'm always like swapping them around and seeing if they fit, if they don't first work. So the order matters. Okay. Oh, the joins. I did mention actually, and I, I should have waited for this slide, but there you go. I was getting ahead of myself. Um, like SQL, we've got left join, inner join. I'm, I don't think it would be called self join, but you would do whatever it is that you're trying to do in terms of the self. So you could use the same data. So it would be um, here, it would be TB underscore cases, left join to TB underscore cases. That would be the self join. Um, Slightly different though. So these exist as concepts in SQL, but not in join formation. These are called filtering joins in R specifically, in dplyr, even more specifically. And what it's doing is um, in SQL, it's called exists in your where clause or not exists. And these are equivalent to semi join or anti join in R. To go through this image, it caught me out the last time I gave this course. I was looking at it thinking, this is an inner join. Um, I'm really confused. So it looks really, really similar. And I guess this is why exists is quite an advanced use of coding. It feels like it is. I, I didn't use it for years as a SQL analyst. Because what we're doing on this is seeing if they match on the left and the right. And if they don't match on the left and don't match on the right, we drop them. So far, it's like an inner join. And then we're also dropping all of the right though, which is not like an inner join because an inner join is bringing the two together when they match. But in this case, we're dropping, to, I don't know what that looks like on your screen, whether it's the left or the right. We're dropping one of the tables data. We're dropping the data Y because it matched, but we don't want that data. To kind of give it into a use case, which I was grateful for this when I gave a course, somebody instantly got this and they said, oh, yes, I would use this for hospital test cases because this was through the pandemic period or bit up well, we're still in it, really, um, at the height of the pandemic period. Going into hospital, people who had COVID tests, um, what they wanted to know was had they had a test. They didn't want to know the results. They just wanted to know that they'd gone along and had a test. And so they want to join their 
patient list with their COVID test list, match to it, but then have no information from your COVID, which is a really nice example, use case example. So if I type this out, TB cases, using my tables of TB cases. So TB cases, uh, then pipe, next line, semi join, and then TB new table. Now this is where I'm gonna contrive or not contrive, I'm gonna extend that idea of the self join. I can take this out actually, and I might do just because it'd be a bit more clear and then pop it back in. I'm doing kind of like a sub query, maybe another table, which I'm then gonna join into. I'm gonna filter the TB new table by first letter equals A. So if I run that, I get this very small information here. I can then cut that and put that back into my semi join. So it's my new table, really. I have done this in SQL where I've done a select star, but I've, I've done it within your join. I think it slows it down, but this doesn't seem to slow it down too much. And then I'm going to join to that new shortened table by saying, I should say data frame, shouldn't I? Not table. Talking too much about SQL. Country equals place, because confusingly, we have multiple, and I've not done the closed brackets, and then year, year equals year. If I run that, I'm only bringing back those that match with the A, but it's, it's a bit superfluous as data. I don't really want that as a column, just saying A, A, A. I don't want this first letter column in my data set here. So I've done a semi join and dropped it. I'm going to leave this and see if you've got any questions on semi join or exists in SQL. I really don't know if that is, I don't know if X lookup goes down that route at all. It'd be interesting to know how that works. And while that's going, any questions? Uh, we've got anti join showing up here, which is the kind of opposite of the filtering. I'm looking to see what doesn't match. And then if it doesn't match to the right, if it does match, I drop it. And if it doesn't match, I keep the, the left side, but I don't bring anything of the right. So far, so good. But it probably helps if I put it into another case scenario, again, given by somebody else who came to the courses. I cannot take credit for this. This is another superb one. In text mining, we have lots of stop words in our vocabulary, like but and 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 or. There's there's a lot of them. So there's a list often kept when people do their text mining, which they want to match against. And they don't want those words, but they don't want them to appear in their data set. So what they would do is take a list of things, might be like staff, food, um, outcomes, operation, those kind of words. And you want to match them against your stop list. And you want to bring back those other words, but if it matches with but and 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 all, because it's big text we're talking about, then you just drop those. So you don't keep anything to do with your stop words, which would be lovely. If I show that in the scenario of our TB cases, control shift and M for the pipe and anti join, which is found, which is great. TB, I'll just take this out again, just to show you TB new cases. It's the same as before, really, isn't it? I've just realized. TB new table, pipe that, filter, first letter. Again, we're looking for first letter. Equals test of equality, just to remind you, A, same again, popping that back into my anti join. And then I'm going to copy the by because there's lots of it. I'm going to match by country and year. And then I'm going to run that. But I have lost. At some point, a bracket. And I'll copy the code so you can just have a look at the code and I'll explain it here. So it's finding all of those countries and in the years that do not match to the first letter being A, which was essentially Afghanistan in this context. Very contrived, but simplistically so. And we again, we don't bring anything over from the right hand side data. I mean, you could have done this a different way. You didn't have to join it to a table, but it's just trying to give a simple example. And you no longer have Afghanistan in there because it matched to the same positive match, but then it's a, a negative outcome in the sense, so it doesn't match. 
Now those might be completely new concepts, absolutely completely new, or they might be something that you're familiar with and you've used a little bit, say in the where clause of SQL using exists. They do come in handy. Can you do a substring? Yes, you can. Um, I think it's called substring. Yep, substring is a function in itself. So I would recommend if you're doing substrings as well, so that's like parts of your words, to also look at those two packages um, because they can be quite useful called string R and string E. And also if people are familiar with some programming languages, grep and grepl, that's another way of doing substring, but substring does exist as well. So um, that would be like char index and match maybe. I'm not sure actually thinking about that. So lots of these things do exist. And nicely, they sometimes have the same names, which means that you can sort of like check to see if it exists. It's a bit like learning a new language and like, oh, shall I just check to see if this word exists in this often romance language? Because English does have some words that are romance languages and yay, it does match and it is the same thing. Sometimes you have false friends though, so they don't always work out to be the same thing. Like, um, I was just thinking a word then. Nope, uh, false friends like uh, group by. And the next question is about case statements. Yes, absolutely. Depending on where you're from and what your um, software uses, if else might be a common thing that you use, say in Excel, that exists as well in R. And I really liked case when from SQL. And that has slightly different syntax, but the logic is exactly the same as in SQL. So it, it's sort of, it's very, very familiar. You just got to kind of like get the tweaks right. Uh, if you ever have any problems, please do ask in NHSR Slack. And those are my favorite questions because I love them. Right, brilliant. Thanks for the questions. There's lots of exciting, and it's a bit like that. It's like, I want, you might do a bit of your coding and then go, right, now I want to do this. How do I do that? I know how to do it in, whatever language or program it is that you use, that's learning. And I did a lot of that and I still do. I'm like, it works here in this context. How do I do it in that? Right. Oh, will it accept an IIF statement? I actually don't know what that is. Um, is that from Excel? I don't know what that does. I'm thinking possibly, but that's my lack of knowledge of what an IIF does. <laughs> SQL. Oh, that's really good. Could you share some information on that? I don't know that one. I've always used case when. If style. Oh, we're getting into SQL here and I'm, I'm, I feel like I should know this. Yes, if else, if else. I avoid, I mean, we're getting into programmatic, programmatic, programmatic language here. I kind of avoid if else because I get confused when you have them all nested together, but lots of other people are fine with that. And so that I quite like R and dplyr as well, and that you can mix and match whatever you prefer. So I think it will do. I think I think pretty soundly it will do. It's just my own knowledge is a bit lacking in that area. Okay, so bringing that culmination of things um, to R Markdown, this is really not gonna do it enough justice to R Markdown because it is a subject in its own right. It's been extended to a new, fun a new uh, type of script called Quarto because it's so good. Uh, they've worked on making that accessible to other language users so that they can get the benefits of R Markdown without necessarily having to come into an R environment like R Studio. Um, if you're using VS Code, you can use R. Um, you can use R. I think I've I've not set it up myself, but certainly Quarto users will be able to use it that way too. I'm going to show you R Markdown because there's a lot of stuff out on the internet already. But feel free if you kind of go, yeah, that's nice, but I want to use the really new one out there, the Quarto. People are working on it and discovering it and it's been extended already. So it's very, very new, but um, I'm just going to concentrate as we have done for the past on our markdown because you're likely to inherit if you do share and collaborate with other people in your code, our markdown. But we're going to be in a world pretty soon, I think, where we're kind of moving between the two. Now, one of the... Um, it's it's a very different format, so it feels like the language sort of changes as well for it, and it can be quite tricky. So the thing about R Markdown and also Shiny Apps, so this was a piece of advice I got from one of Chris Beely's courses, which are also on the YouTube, is to always go for the template first of all in the system because it will run, and then you know that you've got all of the layout 
correctly listed without having to type it from scratch. So if you go to file and new file, where you've got the R script quartos now up there, it's kind of got a new placement as well, quite high up. It's about the fifth down, R markdown dot, dot, dot. So we're gonna get a wizard when I click on that. Now this wizard is useful in itself. It's been added to if you're in a later version of RStudio. Earlier versions didn't have this use current date. So what's happened is over time, people are always putting dates into the R markdown and then RStudio have gone, well, we need to update our wizard really and give people the option to use the current date if they want. So you can put in your date, but you can now set it so it says use current date. So every time you run it, it will use the date that you're running it on. I'm gonna change the title to my report. So it's a real title. So it's just with spaces and things. Oh, look, it's got my name in there already. I think that's Edge just knowing who I am. You can do these default output formats. So HTML is very accessible. Um, puts out an HTML for a document, which you can then email on its own. It doesn't have to have any connection to anything else. It's not like saving a web page where you sometimes have like a folder with other bits in there. It's self-contained. It's just the one document and that can go out on its own. It's really good for interactivity as well for the output that you've got in there. So I'll show you a few examples of that. Whereas PDF and Word are a bit more static. So you don't have, they're just the, the documents that we are familiar with. I find HTML really good because it's accessible to screen readers. So I take that as a hint to use it. It's interactive, it's agnostic to your browsers, but there's a huge problem with the NHS in that we still have a lot of systems set to Internet Explorer. So I have had it, not so much now, but if you send a report to somebody and they say, I can't open it, First step is to see which browser it defaults to because it might be one of the older unsupported but still used in the NHS Internet Explorers. When I say screen readers, it's a really good question. I mean people who have limited vision and they might use um, an automated system to read for them. So their computer is reading the text. That's fine. So screen users, of course, I said screen users. That's my own fault for language. Oh, fair enough. Screen readers. Oh, no, maybe readers. So they're using technology to assist their access to reports and all of our information that should be out in the public domain should be accessible now I know my trust has lots of pdfs and I do sort of say how accessible is it and I go by a lot of what the government data science um, people do the campus ons government statistical services there's a lot of advice around using software that you don't have any cost to so not everybody has word at home but you can use like these generic ODT, I think, which means that you can, it's free. So you could open it in any um, kind of text-based program, including Word and screen readers, meaning that somebody can read using a screen or visual aid. And HTML is kind of flexible in that you can zoom in and zoom out. So I really, really like it. And I also like it as a, as a user myself. I find it a lot easier to manipulate the size and things. And these slides, for example, have all been created using something that I can then publish on HTML on the web that then I can resize and things you can't do that so easily with PDF and Word. It resizes automatically, for example. So there's lots of nice features about it. But this um, sort of wizard gives you an option of what you want. So it might be that PDF is something that you need to output to, or you could be doing it to presentation slides. So you can select PowerPoints down here. Um, we're going to just do the HTML because it's kind of like straight out of the, the system and it will be easy to do. And the reason, nope, not the reason, I, I'll just clear this so that get rid of that bit. Get rid of that. No, I won't. Oh, maybe I will. Um, <clears throat> it looks slightly different as your report. So it has a different icon at the top, whereas previously it said the R in a blue, a uh, white R in a blue circle. This has a tiny on my screen, but it's RMD in white in a red circle. It has this different kind of formatting with the title and the output. So there are sections within R Markdown and they do different things. But the nice bit is if you knit it, which is harking back to some program software thing where you've got um, a ball of wool and some knitting needles and the word knit next to it. Just click on the ball of wool. You have to save the file somewhere. Now, 
if, depending on your setup with your computers, um, you might have to save it to a file that is read write to the computer. Um, the reason why is because it's you're going to save that file and then it's going to generate a new file and it needs to save it somewhere. So if I put my report and I'm going to make that snake case so it's nice and tidy with my system, it goes at the bottom of my uh, folders here, my files, and you can see next to it, I because I'm on the cloud, so I don't have any restrictions, it saves the HTML output too. You just have to be careful if you're on your own computer on a VPN um, that the system, you might have an error, for example, where it says I can't save this because it's not allowed, just, just in case. This runs very quickly and neatly uh, because it doesn't use any packages at all. It's all base R and it's all set up to run these plots. So this plot is not ggplot. This is a base R plot. Very simple, just plot this, and then you get dots. So base R plots, which is what we referred to yesterday, are really, really quick, uh, but manipulating them and putting titles on are a bit harder. And so ggplot2 is an extension of that. But in this case, it means that your R markdown works. So when it comes to debugging, one of the issues could be that you have, you say you inherit somebody else's R markdown or somebody shares some code with you and you try to run it. In the debugging process, you need to make sure, first of all, does your R markdown work on your computer? Then the second bit is what part of the code works and breaks. And so you can use this template to check, does it work just as it is or is there a problem with my computer? And then the sections, you can move them section by section as I have done to see when does something change and when does it break down? So that's nice to start off with. The key part for these reports here for to know that it's an R markdown are these top, uh, it's really these top lines here, the dash, dash, dash on line one and dash, dash, dash on line six and the coding structure in the middle. That's not R, it's called YAML. And I've never really kind of worked out what that means, but I've heard it's like yet another markup language and, um, yet another one or YAML ain't another markup language or something like this. So this is a distinct part. This is a different kind of coding in this area. So if I remove those lines, just to show you, I think it changes the colors. So it breaks it and it won't run as a knit. The errors that you get, oh, it does run. Oh, that was interesting. I think it might've overrun it, but um, it shouldn't have done. Never mind. Very good, very clever. Let's try that. So uh, that's that through me because it worked. There are sections within your report. And the nice thing about R Markdown, there's lots of nice things, but the starting it off is that you're mixing up text with code and charts. So as I was sort of referring to before, where you copy and paste your charts that you produce in R, this brings it all together and then outputs it into the format that you require, whether it's Word or PDF or PowerPoint or you could save it in Excel, but that would be slightly different. But in a report, you're putting words with text, really. I'm going to show you a slightly more detailed script. And I think if you're on the cloud and if you save the files, this should be named as uh, 10. Is it 10 in here? Yes, intro, intro markdown RMD. So this is the code. You should have the HTML as well, but I'm gonna open up the HTML on my screen. So I've got a bit more information in the top. So whereas the default has just at the very, very top title, author, date and output, this being the today's date using an R within it. So it's a, a sort of like a, a script of R within this other language with today's date. So if I take sys.date, and put it in the console and run it just to show you that's today's date. <coughs> the intro to um, R Markdown 10 has a bit more information. And as I said before, uh, about when we were bringing in dates into the format, we can change the format within, so it, it looks more friendly. I'm just trying to think of who the the author, not the authors, the receivers of the report would be, would and they would probably recognise, more likely recognise date, full month, year, and you can do lots of other things with the format. This is all R, but it's hidden within this um, 
string, back tick string, rather than quotations. And there we get the date as well. I haven't run that one. Also, this is an old one, so I ran this in June, but this is the new one. Knit often and knit early. So if I knit this, it's quite quick. And you can see the date has changed, which is the today's date. So that was automatic. But if I changed the um, knit early, knit often and said, mm, this is good advice. That's just writing in some text and then knit it. That's just writing text. It's a, lot, a bit like when you're coding in R, just make a change and see if it appears and see if it appears where you expect it to. Does it run? Does it break? That's not going to change too much because it's text. If people are familiar with Markdown, I learned R Markdown before I even understood that Markdown was a thing. It's a text language, uh, sort of like a coded text language where you are being explicit in code as to whether it's bold rather than clicking and dropping you're doing the coding behind it like we were doing with the charts we were coding behind we were coding how to look at the chart rather than clicking and dropping and so things like insert become bold if you do two asterisks or single you can change whether it's italics or subscript or strike through somebody did ask whether you can do underline and you can but it's very obscure and hard to find because it's not very readable to everybody so it's not really something that is coded into certainly in our studio now I'm just going to try this because sometimes it doesn't always work along the top only appears under the um, our markdown if we do um if you look at the R script, you don't see anything underneath it in terms of visual or source. But if I click on the visual in the R markdown, it changes the layout. And I have this problem actually when it comes to it. Fair enough. I'm not sure. It's because I'm on the cloud. <clears throat> I did briefly get that's unusual. I'm going to open my own screen because I think that might be a bit better. It doesn't always seem to work on the cloud for some reason, but if I open my own system, and this is where I will find, oh, I'm in workshop already. How cool is that? And if I open that and use visual in my own R Studio, Oh, I get all of these errors. Unable to act. Oh, no, it does the same thing. You probably saw really, really briefly that there were some options there that sort of appeared that would be very familiar to word users where it said like there's a button for bold and a button for I. Um, I'm not quite sure. Unable to activate visual mode document contains example lists which are not currently supported. Ah, oh, I've got lists in here. Let's see if I can remove them. So this came from Simon Wellesley Miller's work and maybe isn't being supported at the moment. Ah, there we go. So now I have changed it. Let's just make it better. So for some reason, the lists that Simon Wellesley Miller did a year or so ago are not supported in the visual view, but I'll show you what he did here. So he, I copied this from his um example report that he's also done a workshop. Uh, it's on YouTube for NHSR community and I've got links to it on my um, course material. So uh, it's really useful. He goes through step by step what he's got in there and I'll show it briefly. Um, but he was showing how you can do different lists, very similar to other formats that we use, say in Word. But for some reason, they're not being supported in this visual view. If I make this a little bit bigger in Oh, now this might be more familiar or more like friendly, friendlier for people to use where you can see how this is a header. But if you wanted to change the header, you can then do it within the drop down menus. Source and visual options not on the desktop version. It depends on your version of RStudio. So this is a very new addition to RStudio. So it may be that you need a later version of our studio. I, I've been lucky enough that my trust of, makes it available as soon as, well, not as soon as, I have to wait a bit, but I get an updated version of our studio. So our studio has been worked on as much as even the packages. So this is quite nice for people who are visual users or familiar with Microsoft products 
I must admit, I struggle a bit more with this because I quite like the code element of things. But this is nice that the text kind of like is is prominent in it. And then the code has its the chunks as that's referred to in our markdown and you can write your code within there. That doesn't look codey because that's kind of comments, but this looks more familiar. Now, if I minimize that, now I've worked out what the problem is, I'll get rid of those lists here. Delete the lists. Let's see if that will. No, nope, not enough list removal. Oh, save. Fair enough. Visual. Use visual mode. There we go. So you can navigate within your R Markdown for the headers. And if you're using Markdown, they're denoted by hashes. A single hash is the most the header one. But if you're using it like this in visual mode, you can then still select them. So it sees them by the header level. And so that means you can navigate throughout your report online. Now, I tend to use R Markdown as well, interestingly, as a workflow. So I use it for script and code, but I don't always knit. So knitting is quite separate for me in my workflow. If you knit your R Markdown, it needs to run from top to bottom in order and with everything available to it. So as we look at the bottom down here, we've got code listed. That code needs to be available, that data needs to be available to this system, which is from a section where we put the, the load data. So if I knit this, it will pop out. And there we have our report. But what I tend to do, if I just remove this kind of like a table of contents in a sense with the line, 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 and move that over so I've got more space. I tend to also use these chunks as little like little R scripts in my R markdown. When I first was taught about R markdown, they said if you use comments more than code, use R markdown. And if you use more code than um, the other way around, let's say, use scripts. And I forever now start with scripts and then move to R markdown because I actually use it as a workflow tool. But when I'm in my workflow, so I'm staying flow in my R studio. If you run your current chunk, it might be actually, I need to tell it to run tidyverse. So if I just run that, it loads tidyverse, which was already loaded. These have got comments. And then if I use the, I'm using the green arrow to the right to run the current chunk, it then puts that object in my object file. So I'm really running an R script, but in this thing called R markdown. And I just find it a lot easier to combine the two together because things eventually become reports. And it might just be like an internal thing to you, like a section by section, like auditing, or I use this data set and you know these are the caveats to this data and this methodology. And it's easier to do that without doing comment, 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 comment. But you'll find your own way, I think, um, in what you like to use. In um, Simon Wellesley Miller's examples, he does these things like uh, different headers and lists, which broke, unfortunately, but also showed that you can mix and match your HTML. You can write HTML directly into your text in your R Markdown. But then if we go to the, is that a spelling mistake? Oh, it looks like I've got a spelling mistake. Availability. Hmm. A bit T. Oh, I can see. I've got a spelling mistake. You get a spell check, which I didn't realize there. So it does it automatically in that visual mode, but you can also check your spelling as well. So it, it's quite familiar in the text part with Word. So this is nice for me in that it mixes the two together. So I don't have to go out to Word. I don't have to go to another program. I can just do that all together. Beds plot, if I run that one, it appears somewhere, does it appear? Oh, maybe it doesn't. If I could just run it in the code. Oh, I'm not getting that running. Symbol if the. I'm going to go back to source because I'm getting a bit lost in that. Why is that doing if the? Oh, there we go. I don't know why my, I, I is me, it's totally me. I have a problem with visual things, which is probably why I struggle with things like um, Excel. I like to code. And so I'm okay when it's in source, I can see it and visual, but uh, I can't sort of problem solve when it's visual. There are some, I'll show you in a second, actually, there are some 
packages that work in R that are like visual wizards. And they're really useful for creating things like ggplots and it gives you the code afterwards. And I can't use that myself, but they're really useful for other people to get into it. Like you're just kind of like dragging and dropping and clicking on things and like it's in a dashboard. So it's everybody's different. So it's just it's available to those people who like that uh, interaction, whereas I struggle with my mouse and I struggle with the visual. It's totally me. Right. So this runs and now you can see that I ran it and it appeared in my report. So it's in there rather than in the external. So I can use my workflow here to create objects and then also show them. If you like the visual, just so that you know, in tools and global options, there's a whole tab of R Markdown. And in there, I think it might be in visual. You can use the visual editor by default. So if you really like the visual editor and you never want to go back to that outline code, that's fine. You can set it to global so that every time you open up an R Markdown, that's one. That's what you'll always get to see. There are other things as well that you can do, but that's um, not something I'll necessarily cover today. There's a lot in here to run and work with. Uh, what I would say, if I go back, so this is the next example, but Simon Wellesley, Miller, Wellesley Miller's example is one that I really enjoyed going through. His code is available in the cloud or in the downloads. It's also got some links through my website too. He has a lot of information in here as well. So you can see all the libraries. This is why it's quite nice to have them at the top so you can see them all together, what you require. They all seem to be loaded as well, so you don't get that error. Not error, but the bar, the message at the top. There's a lot of information in there to set it up and then his introduction. But what I liked doing in this is kind of going through and looking for his code and seeing where it would be related to. So if you go down and say, um, how did he do the superscript? Well, that's a word. So if I then look at the code and go superscript, oops, if we could spell superscript, I can find the superscript that he's written and then find the outline code that he's used if you're not using a visual, of course, because you can use control and F. I just did that without thinking and search for words within scripts. You can also replace as well, which is nice. Um, I want to point out these two features here. So on the left, you've got a table of contents, which is floating, which means it never moves. It always stays. And as you scroll down, what is a really long report, it moves down and highlights and you can see things here and it just it's interactive. That's the interactive part of HTML. And also in this section up here, he's got listed download RMD. So if you were to share um, a, a report like this, but you wanted the code to be available either because it's somebody else who <laughs> that GIF is quite distracting. If you um, have a uh, code that you want to share with, say, another analyst or somebody who could run this or even for your future self, just be careful that you don't refer to any fixed data in there like a person, a patient, a staff member, because it would appear because it is the code itself. It is this H, this RMD because this doesn't have any patient information in it. This would be what's listed in the top as the code, which I've moved because the GIF was moving. The way he's done this is just a very small amount of code. So the output is HTML document, which is what we can see. TOC stands for table of contents equals true. And TOC float means it's floating. But he's also got, I think it's not in this actually. Um, I think it's in mine though. Let's have a look. It's missing actually. Code download is the other feature actually, because this is this looks like it's been updated. It might not run off the cloud, but what we require in here is also code download is true. So that's that button at the top, code download. That's all you need to write. And then you've got all of your code available. If I click on it, download RMD, you can see it becomes an RMD. And actually that's version five. Yeah, interesting. I've got version six here. For some reason, he must have removed it. Okay, so I'm gonna whiz through his examples. He's shown all, not all, I don't think, different types of charts, 
interactive tabs that you can flip between because you might have multiple charts and it becomes really, really, really long, but you might just want them in a section like he's got here with provider codes, results by provider. If you were to do that, look for results by provider. All you're doing is adding a little bit of code here saying curly brackets dot tab set top. So you could copy it essentially. I would recommend um, I do an R Markdown course, but the material is also available and I talk about tab sets specifically just to break it down a bit more. But I'm going to skim over it at the moment just to show you that this is a possibility. Um, and if you needed to get into it at a later stage and wanted to find out more information where to go or just have a question because you tried to try something and it didn't quite work out what you want as you wanted it, please do get in touch with us at uh, NHSR Slack group. If we move down, I think just because people will be familiar with this, you've got the different kind of layouts of the tables, conditional formatting, which you get in Excel, but this is for report writing. Um, you can have, there's a package called DT where you can set what the output looks like. Search is interactive. I have to caution that this isn't interactive if you use PDF or Word. So this is why HTML is really good. Data can be expanded upon, reduced, um, and a squeeze is the package where you can import it in, you can take the, install the package, and it comes into an area that's called, um, where is it? I'm doing it from memory, add-ins, sorry. And then if you've added in certain things, you, you can have it in there. I don't think a squeeze is added into this, but it comes up with a wizard that's visual and you can click and drop and produce charts like this, but then it gives you the code afterwards. Plus also, I think he might have given a bit more information in the comments. So I've been using this his report by going, oh, I really like that bit. What does that look like in the code and working between the two? Plotly, we've mentioned, which is the interactive chart. Now you can see it in its, all its glory. You get these kind of functions which just are built in. So you can take screenshots and zoom in and all sorts of things. And I think, actually, Plotly, he did what I suggested that you could do is create your ggplot, which you're more familiar with now from to yesterday and today, and then made it interactive by putting ggplotly around it. And that's just one verb. That's the beauty of our and programmatic language where you can create functions that just take a lot of code and make it so that you just need to just write ggplotly. So in underneath that is probably a heap of code, which you don't need to be worried about. You can just take one bit and make it interactive. Animated charts, this isn't a great purpose for animation, but it is nice that you can do some animated charts and collapsible trees. I like this. I like clicking on it, but it's meaningless, but it looks lovely. Keep going down, you get a map um, example and a word cloud example and pivot tables, which you might be quite keen to reproduce, uh, although that's all zero. And that's the end, of, like whistle, whistle stop tour in a sense, because I'd like you to come to the course or think about the other course materials or follow up with this. I'll share this link for our markdown. I gave the caveat at the beginning that really don't do it justice. It's just like, here, look at this, isn't it amazing? And then I use another course to break it down step by step and explain it as I've been doing today, but and yesterday using ggplot and dplyr, there's a lot of stuff, but hopefully it's kind of gone, oh, I really want to do that. That looks really cool. And you can see the code and you can always ask us for stuff. I'm not going to do database connections. I seem to have messed up my um, links there, but let's see. Uh, I've, less, I've moved my code. Okay, I give me a second. I've messed up my links on my screen, but what I can try and do is recover from that and find my work in online, offline even, NHSR. No, let me see if I've got the data sets. Oh, I know where they'll be, just thought. NHSR slides, so NHSR community GitHub. So this is a nice uh, quick look. This is not really what we should be doing, but um, I'm going to go to intro R, 
and go to training materials, which I've got down here, HTML pages, and then find, oh, maybe it's here actually, sorry, it's published. And then I want to do workshop learning, ongoing learning. That's what I needed. Right, I need to correct my link. Apologies for that. Ongoing learning. <clears throat> Right, R is like learning any language at all. So a verbal language, a, a European language, an international other country language. It gets easier the more you practice it, the more you use it. It's very difficult to say you've learned something and then never visit it and then come back and go and starting again. So it takes time. Immersion is always good, no matter whether you're learning a spoken language or using a coded language. But it isn't always easy to do because we've got time pressures put upon us and we have to consider getting things out quickly. So if somebody comes along, you don't really want to be doing it when you're learning your new language and also doing the problem solving that you're needing to do. There are a few ways around it or better way, not better ways, or sort of recommendations. It took me a long time to get into R, mainly because of that. Working with other people was one of the better ways. So working together or inheriting somebody else's code and working through it, breaking it, that's a good way of learning, making mistakes. Or if you've got something that you already have, like you have a chart in Excel or you have some statistics from SPSS or MATLAB and you know the output, you know what it should look like, then if you go to R and then do the same thing there, then you know it looks right when you get the right output. So you're reproducing what you've already done but you're problem solving and learning your, your thing, your new language as you go along. Quick fixes, it says quick fixes, and I'm not entirely sure they are, well, Google Stack Overflow is, is a, an art form in finding things. And I'll go through that one. I wouldn't say it was, well, I wouldn't say it was a quick fix because there's, there's a lot of stuff you can learn through Stack Overflow. I did mention yesterday, there's more than one style of writing R. There's more than one package doing it. There's not just ggplot2 for um, charts and visualizations. And there's not just dplyr for data work and manipulation. There's also data table and then there's base R. And so you've got lots of options and you've got old options that are no longer used, but they'll still be referenced in Stack Overflow. It's best to go with one style. You might go from today and go, dplyr doesn't make sense I, I i've seen a bit of base r i'm going to go with that and that's fine just go with that one and focus on that one and as time goes on things will make sense when you're googling or searching using another search engine i'd always suggest trying to put whatever package it is that you want it to be referenced in in your um question so if you said um like you said self-join self-join dplyr because you'll get different options when you say self uh, self-join R and you'd have to put R because that's kind of like a, a SQL thing so you'll get SQL answers as well which you may already know the answer to. Beware of the date of the answer it says that. I think it's beware as in, well it's actually quite tricky, some of the newer ones get fewer likes as in upticks but they're most up to date so they're not going to be like hundreds and thousands unlike things like um, SQL been here for such a long long time you can rely upon the upticks and I'll explain that in a bit. Here's an example. So this example um, has been going 10 years and 11 months, 90,000 times. Some of that must be in training as well, but not that much. They have a, a question that's been uh, modified, actually. And the answers here at the top data table is actually quite high up from 2011, though. And as I said, data table is a form of um, syntax for it's very, very fast. And there are some analysts in NHSR Slack who use it and really like it. It's uh, super fast. It's, it kind of copes as well as SQL does with big data sets. And dplyr doesn't always do it as fast, for example. The next upticked, so if you're going by the order of what's liked, like a TripAdvisor type thing, you would look at base R and go, well, I would look at it and go, uh, how do I fit that in? Um, I'm starting to be more familiar with it, but that's taken a few years of other people's code and looking at it. But I'd be a bit worried about that one. And then the next uptick actually is, it's been, been brought up quite quickly actually, is dplyr. I think somebody's tidied this up actually, because it used to have more examples. But underneath that one, plyr was the precursor to dplyr and it gets 18 upticks. 
So 20 and 18, there's not much difference between them, but this is quite old now. And what is nice is that some people are going in and updating their own reference, their own response or others, if they have that capacity to say, you know, this has now been superseded or this is now being used elsewhere. And as I mentioned before, if you use a function in dplyr that has been deprecated, so it's available still, but it's no longer supported, you'll get a message when you use it saying, this has been deprecated, we advise you use this other one. So you do get some more feedback from your functions in dplyr at least, maybe some other projects as uh, packages as well. Um, actually, what's interesting is when I usually do this one, it's down towards the bottom that people would you I would say oh, I would use that one because it's got a cross in it and I like a cross it's a new verb that's come in but in fact where is it now it's been upticked over time so people have come across this question and upticked it so over time it has been picked up but there are some good questions good answers that are much lower down so my tactic for stack overflow is to be explicit about the language you're using R and be explicit about the package to give you a bit of a fighting chance of finding it. Read through all of the comments, go for the ones that you're familiar with. And sometimes people are really, really nice and they'll say, this is a base R answer, this is a data table answer, and even in the same comment, and then this is dplyr, and they might keep it up to date. So that's really nice. And that's good about Stack Overflow that people can go back and add to the questions. You might want to do some more um, research and reading and there are lots of books on, online and on paper. I've mentioned R for Data Science that's available and also ggplot is available online. It's available, of course it's available, it's available online. There's another book that's online and you can contribute to it because you can see NHSR communities there as well in the book clubs and Oscar Barufa is a, if I said his name correctly, um, is an analyst in um, the Netherlands, I think, and he started this off and it's it's grown and grown and grown because as you can see in the big book, there's all manner of resources. So I think he started this as a, a tiny project and it's just grown and grown and grown. There are all sorts of themes and um, so coding themes like cleaning your data or journalism as in the theme for journalism. It's just expanded. It's an immense resource and I honestly wouldn't know where to start with it, but there's just all sorts of stuff in there. But you can contribute to this because it's online. So you can leave issues on GitHub and you could leave your own resource if you had something for yourself on there um, or other people's and benefit from it all or highlight it to other people. So it says 150 plus. I'm sure there's more than that. That must be a really old picture. There are also blogs if people like getting like daily blogs or weekly blogs for information. There's also the NHSR community blog. Now, our blog doesn't go out by email to people in a distribution, but let's see if it goes to it. You've got um, blogs from individuals. So that goes to the people. Let's go to the blogs themselves. So they're on all sorts of subjects, both technical and about experiences, for example. So when I first started using blogs, I used this one. Oh, there's an NHSR package. That's a nice one. And I practice blogging because this wasn't something that I was ever really exposed to as an analyst before. So I just submitted my blogs to the NHSR community and it kind of gets like sense checked that it's OK and it goes on. And you can submit that in Word or some other format um, that's accessible for websites and for people just to copy and paste. And it's a good way of getting into blogs, just sort of contributing to the community, sharing your experiences and having a go at blogging without having to set up a blog site and thinking about what you need to put into it. Just kind of get involved. Social media is also very big as well, kind of in the news now with Twitter. But there is a, a hashtag called RStats. That's, that should be in capitals there, actually, to make it more readable. Uh, there's a Slack group. I keep saying the Slack group. And then there's government data science channel as well but you need a certain email address to access it. And finally, there's so much information out in the, in, it's quite difficult to navigate, I find sometimes. But what I've really appreciated is that lots of people have shared their materials, they get reshared. So Jenny Bryan works for RStudio. Danielle Navarro was the person I showed you her artwork. And she was, when she published this, working at the university, but she's moved to another job. But she based her project structure 
presentation on Jenny Bryan's, but credited her. And that's now available to link to, and she's got YouTube videos. And it's just things like, this is a very, it seems basic really, naming files and project structure. But lots of uh, people working in academia certainly have said they have noticed that younger people are coming in and they've never really had to save their files in certain areas because when you use iPads or um, tablets, it kind of does it all for you. So you don't really need that experience. You don't need to have that experience. And as you saw from Simon Wellesley Millers, he's got version five and version six. How you save it matters. And it's just a nice little thing. And I've linked to her presentation through my presentation. So it's a presentation side presentation. And you just get these uh, nice things that are out there in the internet. I'm about five minutes over, um, but I hope that was okay. And uh, I'm gonna stop sharing. Kind of rush through that last bit. There's so much resource out there, particularly for R, a lot for data science. And it's quite an exciting place to be in, but friendly as well. And I think that's the key to it. So if you find something that you enjoyed or uh, find, even when it's things like a keyboard shortcut, you may think that everybody knows it, but in fact, you share that. I've done this on Twitter and I was like, wow, I didn't know that. There's just so much information in our studio, setting it up, things are new in packages. It's ever evolving and it's a wonderful place to be in. And um, I'm really pleased that you've all joined me over these last days. I'm going to, have I stopped sharing and I'm going to stop recording and say thank you to everybody and see you again soon on the recording. <laughs>